Good evening, everybody. Can people hear me? Yep. Right. Welcome to Hammond Midland Forum's council meeting, including all of our guests in the audience and those watching on YouTube. I'm Councillor Patricia Quigley, Mayor of the London Bar of Hammond Forum, and I will be chairing tonight's meeting. I would like to be addressed as simply as Mayor. This is a hybrid meeting where Councillor will be contributing from home as well as from here in the chamber. Members joining remotely cannot participate or vote in decision reports. By participating in tonight's meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. I once again welcome our guests in the audience to this meeting. This is the most important civic meeting of the council to ensure that the meeting runs smoothly, no heckling is allowed, nor any other type of interruption will be tolerating while people are speaking. Councillor, if the whip has not provided me with your name and you wish to speak, please raise your hand and wait until I call you. If you wish to raise a point under standing orders, please raise your hand and I would invite you to speak at a suitable point. When called to speak, please state the standing order you wish to use. Please wait patiently and do not interrupt the person speaking. If you wish to raise a point of order or personal explanation, and, uh, you may interrupt the councillor speaking. However, please ensure your points are factual, are brief and to the point. Please be patient. At the end of each debate or report, I will put, formally put the recommendations or motion to the vote. For the councillors joining on Zoom, please keep your microphone muted unless you are speaking. I would also like to remind members that it is customary for members to stand when speaking, you, if you are able, so you can be clearly heard and seen. If you are watching at home and would like to follow along with the agenda, there is a link in the description on YouTube. Fire alarm instructions. If the fire alarm sounds, please leave the meeting in an orderly fashion by the nearest exit, which is in the lift lobby and down the stairs. Do not use the lifts. Don't stay behind to collect your personal belongings. Officers will direct you to the assembly point in Shortland Road. If you can't use the stairs, officers will escort you to a refuge area. The meeting will be taken as adjourned until it can safely resume business. Finally, toilet can be found in the lift lobby. Item one. Apology for absence. Thank you, Mayor. Apologies have been received from Councillors Rosenberg, Suslus, Apthorpe, and Harvey. Councillor Sadiq is joining on remotely, and Councillor Kwan will be lead. Thank you. Thank you. Item two declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? Council uh, Mayor, thank you. It's not a declaration of interest, but for personal work reasons, I will leave the meeting during special motions one and six, and would be grateful if that could be recorded in the minutes. Thank you. Item three, minutes. Is it the wish of the council that I sign the minutes of the annual and special council meetings held on the 24th of May, 2023?
first time doing that. Right. Item four, Mayor's announcements. Pins official birthday honours list 2023. On behalf of the council, I'd like to know our congratulations to the following people who were recognised in the Koenig's birthday honours list with their outstanding achievements. <laughs> Professor Peter Barnes, Professor of Thoracic, Thoracic Medicine and at Imperial College London, was awarded a knighthood for service to the respiratory science. David Boxton, Chief Executive Officer at Action on Disability and lately Chair of the British Deaf Association, <laughs> was awarded an OBE for services to the deaf and British sign language communities. Patricia London, Chair, Strategic Lay Form at Imperial College Healthcare, NHS Trust, was awarded an MBE for services to health and social care. Brenda Del Capio, Ward Manager, Acute Medicine at Imperial College Health Care, NHS Trust, was awarded an MBE for services to nursing. Mark Younger was awarded a BEM for services to the community in Parting Green. I'd like to congratulate you all again, and I'd like to thank them for all their hard work and contributions. Contributions and well done, everyone. Item five public questions. I'd like to thank all the residents who took the time to submit questions to tonight's meeting. Public question time is limited to 20 minutes. If a question does not receive a reply in the meeting, a written response will be sent and published in the minutes. For ease of reference, I have provided a copy of your question for you. All of the questioners called will have an opportunity to ask a brief follow-up question. Please can you observe all the rules I have earlier explained. Question one, I'd like, I, I invite. I invite Donald Grant to ask a question to Councillor Stephen Cowan, leader of the council. Please, can you read your question? Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, all. I'd like to ask the uh, leader of the council a question. So the Clean Air Neighbourhood LTN trial to the west of Wandsworth Bridge Road has been in for longer than the six week minimums required, six month minimum required by the government guidance. During the closure of Wandsworth Bridge this summer, there will be little through traffic, yet still no short route will exist to Sands End West from New Kings Road and vice versa for visiting vehicles. Will the leader therefore suspend the traffic cameras in South Fulham during the, the bridge closure this will let visitors access all roads and businesses in Sand End by their quickest, shortest, least polluting route without the intrusion of registering visitors on a repurposed parking app. I invite the leader to provide a response. Councillor Holder, please. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, in answer, uh, Mr. Grant, the answer is no. Um, opening up the roads to all traffic during the closure would mean sat-navs systems would try to reroute drivers into residential streets. This would bring um, back the gridlock we had finally got rid of after many years. It would cause chaos and inconvenience to residents and businesses alike, and it would generate more pollution. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up question? Yes, thank you. I do, because I also live in a residential road where all the traffic has now been forced to. And I would like to ask um, around the, um, the Secretary of State for Transport, um, stated at the weekend, that local councils should remove traffic schemes which do not have 
public support and review unpopular ones. So when will the councillors and the leader instruct the removal or a review of the South Fulham traffic camera schemes? I invite, sorry. I invite Councillor Holder to respond, please. I think the uh, simple answer to that is that we disagree, myself or us, um, and the Secretary of State. The truth is um, we have evidence to show that our, and I won't call it a low traffic neighborhood if you don't mind, because it's not that, it's a clean air neighborhood scheme. Um, and I'm holding in my hand a Ms. piece of Mr. paper. Grant. Mm -hmm. Mr. Grant, I'm sorry. This is a question to the uh, council holder. She's trying to give a response. I would appreciate if you could allow her to finish her response. Thank you, council holder. Um, as I was saying, we disagree. Our Clean Air Neighbourhood programme that has been agreed and sanctioned by our residents um, at, shows that we have evidence to back up that our residents in the area would like us to continue for the time being. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Mr. Grant. Yes. Mayor, you, that, you, I'm sorry, you talked Grant. about facts. You said the council should be factual. Mr. Grant. I'm the mayor. That's fine. We only have 20 and minutes. We, okay, and we we like to, I would like to point minutes. out that the factual evidence Mr. Ross, is yeah, it's we only have LPN, 20 minutes. low traffic neighbourhood. Thank you. I've been informed that Siobhan Cummings is unable to attend, so a written response will be provided. Uh, question three I invite Vivian Goodson. To ask a question to Councillor Stephen Cowan, Leader of the Council. Please, can you read your question? Ms. Goldson. Good evening, Mayor, Councillors, everyone. How many contraventions from the traffic cameras were recorded on the day of the Wandsworth Bridge Road Fair? First of all, can I thank you for asking questions full stop? Anyone who comes and asks a public question, I think they're very brave. Okay, so thank you. Um, in response, unfortunately, this question is not actually, is not specific. However, we can say that um, across the borough on that day, we issued slightly less than average numbers of penalty charge notices than we could, um, than we do on a typical Sunday. Thank, thank you. you. Do you have a follow-up question? I do. The trial has shown a devastating drop in footfall in South Fulham. Businesses have been decimated and some have had to close while others are relocating. This experiment is now ruining people's livelihoods. It's ruining our vibrant and historic centre, our feeling of community, and in general, changing our lives for the worse. When, please, will you turn these cameras off? Yeah, but it, well, in answer, oh, I'm going to try and answer. I'm going to start by saying that we are grateful to all the local businesses who sponsored and traded at the Wandra Bridge Road Fair, Spring Fair. Many, many, I might say, reported doing very good trade on the day. And as I've said before, we have evidence that shows that our the residents in that area, it may not be all the residents, um, and we're yet to complete our assessments of what that is, but many residents still believe we should keep the cameras on. And therefore, again, the answer is we are not turning the cameras off, not while we are going through the trial, that is. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I've been informed that Kerry Collins is unable to attend, so a written response will be provided. I invite Mel Hammer to ask a question to Ben, to Councillor Ben Coleman, Deputy Leader of the Council. Please, can you read your question? Um, good evening, all. I know that the government has pushed back the original commitment for funding for the complete rebuild of St Mary's Hospital and the refurbishment and expansion of Charing Cross and Hammersmith hospitals 
to be completed by 2030, as these hospitals are extensively used by residents of our borough, and as Imperial has the biggest backlog of maintenance work in the entire country, what is the council doing to persuade the government of the necessity of restoring St Mary's to the list of top priorities with clear and immediate funding to be completed by 2030 and to advance immediate funding and establish clear dates for the work at Charing Cross and Hammersmith Hospitals. I invite the Deputy Leader to give a response. If you're, thank you for your question, um, Meryl Hammer. Thank you. It's a huge issue, this. Um, you're absolutely right to state that the government has pushed back its original date for the refurbishment and rebuilding of Charing Cross and St Mary's and Hammersmith hospitals um, by, two, by 2030. I mean, there was an indication, as we talked about in the last council meeting, of what was going to happen at the beginning of the year. On the 17th of January, um, we talked here, we noted that the health minister, Will Quince, stated in the House of Commons that Charing Cross and St Mary's and Hammersmith had no planning permission for improvements. And that was already the case on the 17th of January, while claims to the contrary were being made. He said that in the House. But as, as, you, as you allude to, the actual blow came on the 26th of May when the Health Secretary Stephen Barclay told the House of Commons that Charing Cross Hospital and Hammersmith Hospital and St Mary's Hospital were no longer on the list of the 40 hospitals to be refurbished or rebuilt by 2040. He said that in the House of Commons, and he then wrote to Andy Slaughter, MP, and to Greg Hans, MP, a joint letter, and he said that these hospitals, and I quote him, may now fully complete construction after 2030. So um, no shock that Professor Tim Orchard highly respected chief executive of, of Imperial College Healthcare Trust, which runs three hospitals. He immediately called the announcement clearly disappointing, and he warned that it would be hugely damaging, his words, for the health and healthcare of hundreds of thousands of people. Um, so I, I think it's helpful um, to, to me to be able to take this opportunity that we have to be, to say that we have to be absolutely clear. There is no confirmed funding now. There is no deadline now for refurbishing the hospital. Um, and indeed, anyone who doubted that, um, because they may have been reading stuff put out by Greg Hans and other people recently, only needed to go to Hammersmith and Fulham's Health, Health and Wellbeing Board, which is, of course, on the YouTube on, on, on the YouTube channel, you can watch it, on the 22nd of June. And they will have heard Imperial's Director of Engagement and Experience state, and again, I quote, it's clear that the bulk of the capital money to complete the schemes will not be committed until post-2030. She was very, very upset and very worried. She said, we don't know when we will get the main capital funding. The commitment is that it will not be there before 2030. Now, I'm aware that some people are claiming that somehow an absolute statement like that can still be interpreted as meaning the funding is quote unquote secure. I think we can hear exactly from what she says that it is not. And this is very worrying, Madam Mayor because Imperial's hospitals play a key role in the whole of the healthcare system. They provide services, not just to our borough, but also to the, capital, to the whole of England. They care for 1.6 million patients a year, the three hospitals. They host the largest biomedical research center in the, in the country. And Charing Cross is major acute and specialist hospital. Um, but the sad fact is they're all built in the seventies and they all have their need for constant repair, as you've touched on, and you're asking what we would like, what we're going to do about the problem. Well, we know that they've got the largest backlog maintenance liability in the NHS of £105 million. We know that um, Imperial uses half of its capital budget every year just to stay operational. We know that a floor by floor refurbishment would cost around £2 billion. Um, and we know that they were promised this in 2018. It just never happened then. Uh, and they put a bid in for it. enabling works, the small works that need to happen. That hasn't been approved. They're still working on a first stage business case. That hasn't yet gone through or been approved. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if this is boring any of the members opposite, but I think it matters for us to understand absolutely clearly and without any doubt what is happening with Charing Cross Hospital and what is not happening. And the question, the question was asking about this, and I'll, I'll continue to make some progress. I mean, the sad situation, which I don't think has been picked up, if you look at the briefing that the hospitals provided to the Health and Wellbeing Board, and indeed provided to MPs in the House of Commons, they said the only way they're going to get money to do Charing Cross is, quote, if there's slippage 
in capital spending in the new hospital programme. They've said they hope that this will be made available to other suitable schemes that are ready to commence building works. So the only chance that they're getting funding for 2030 is that they can slip in before other people and get piecemeal refurbishment. That's the best they can hope. And the services at St. Mary's and Charing Cross are threatened. St. Mary's has already closed wards, which of course is not just bad for St. Mary's and for the patients who need to be treated there. It's bad for Charing Cross because it puts extra pressure on there. And again, it was made quite clear to us at the Health and Wellbeing Board, if they don't get the money they need for rebuilding, they might have to stop some services completely in the next three to seven years. And this isn't a frivolous situation at all. Anybody who attends any health meetings and talks about these issues ought to understand this and ought to be worried. So I've raised, um, sorry, sorry, uh, Donald, am I boring you? I hope you don't uh, have to use a hospital. Excuse, uh, Councillor Coleman, can I deal uh, with this, please? Yeah, so I've raised uh, our concerns. Councillor Coleman, sorry, can I deal with this, please? I'm asking, um, this is a uh, time for questions and answers. Can you please allow Councillor Coleman to complete his uh, answer? Thank you. Yeah, I, I, so I've raised our concerns. I've raised our concerns publicly. I've raised our concerns as a council at the Northwest London uh, NHS Integrated Care Board, of which I'm a member. I've raised it at the Hammersmith and Fulham's Health and Wellbeing Board. Uh, the next meeting of the Health and, and Care Policy Accountability Committee, for those of you in this room and elsewhere who are interested in what happens to our hospital, will be on the 19th of July, chaired ably by my colleague, Councillor Perez, and they're going to be exploring this further. And I'm also working with my counterparts in Westminster City Council and with colleagues in other boroughs to ensure that residents understand fully the implications for the hospitals of the government's change of heart. Because what we've got to do as a community is we've got to get the government to change its mind. And it's not right, therefore, for local conservative politicians to say that funding is secure when it's not, because that only puts people off making the case that we all need to make, which is to get that funding before and the refurbishment done before 2030. So we're gonna carry on fighting for that. And I hope this has been a helpful response. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up question? Yes. Can I just say, Mayor, that it's very disconcerting to be here trying to ask a question, to listen to the answer and be surrounded by people who are disrupting from behind and to my right. I'm sorry. My supplementary question actually is, thank you for letting me know what the council is is doing about it. As many people here know, I'm actually Secretary of Hammersmith and Fulham Save Our NHS, and we have been on the streets uh, ourselves, uh, leafleting about this and getting signatures on a petition. People are very disturbed about this, but are also being confused by some of the information that is being published by some political figures. Can I ask, what will the council do to counter the inaccurate information that is being put around this borough? I invite the deputy leader to give a response, please. Well, we all we all have a choice, don't we? When the facts stare us in the face, and they stare us in the face because they're there in the uh, recording of the House of Commons um, session where the Secretary of State mm -hmm. said 2030 was no longer um, going to be the deadline for the three hospitals. We can see what Imperial said, both on paper and in its evidence to Health and Wellbeing Board. We all have a choice whether we want to take up the cudgels and fight for Charing Cross again, or whether we wanted to be party political about this and try and claim that things are the case, which are silly, clearly not the case. I can assure you that here we have long experience of fighting alongside residents to save Charing Cross Hospital, not for fun, but because so many people in this borough, and I think there can be virtually nobody in this room, I would expect, who hasn't been helped or doesn't know somebody who has been helped by Charing Cross Hospital. And we all need to keep fighting to ensure that it is the best possible hospital with the most modern facilities so that patients and the people who work there can, patients can get the best that they can and the people who work there can work in the, under the best conditions. And so we will carry on as council, raising this very publicly, working with others, working alongside residents, because at the end of the day, if we don't do that, we're betraying the residents who elected us to fight for their health and well-being. Thank you. Thank you. I invite Jim Brady to ask a question to Councillor Ben Coleman, Deputy Leader of the Council. Please can you read your question? Uh, good evening, Mayor. 
and everybody in, in attendance. I'd last like to ask the following question. The Metropolitan Police Commissioner has written to councils to say their officers will no longer attend mental health calls from 31st of August. What impact will this have on h and social care services? And how is the council preparing for this surprisingly short deadline? Further, is the council engaging with the West London Trust and the ICB to try to mitigate any adverse effects this may have on social services on our overstretched mental health services and local residents? I invite the deputy leader to give a response, please. This is a really, uh, this is a really tough issue. There is one of the one of the most worrying things about the way the world is going since COVID is the huge rise in people with mental health problems. Um, it is a challenging situation for the police to deal with. They're very often the first line of um, uh, dealing with these issues, and they're not necessarily always the best place to do it. And so they have, but they've taken a bit of a uh, I would say crude worry and worrying approach. They've just said, we're going to stop being first line, first line, actually first line of defense. We're mm -hmm. going to be still stopping the first line of contact within three months. Now we can see that there is, um, it is challenging for the police to deal with mental health emergencies. Uh, it, it, it can take far too long for the police to hand over patients um, in health facilities to appropriate health professionals who can help them. It, it, and meanwhile, they can't attend to other, uh, to real crime as opposed to mental health is, but, um, uh, you know, and, and, and people also waiting too long to get assessments and, and, and there are a lot of problems with the system and the fact that there are more and more people needing these issues and there's less and less money in the system because the funding hasn't gone up to keep pace with demand um, for various reasons. Um, we, we understand where the police are coming from. The problem is that if they do this as a rush... Coleman, I'm sorry, we've run out of time. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Yep. Um, I'd like to thank all questionnaire people that have attended our uh, response to the questions will be sent answers thank you uh now councillor carmel you wish to speak yes thank you understanding order 15 e3 given the nature of our residents here tonight and why they're here may i move that special motion number five be given precedence on the agenda Thank you, uh, Councillor Carmel. I will confer with my officers. That is fine. Councillor, sorry. Thank you. Special motions listed on the agenda be taken in the following order, um, starting with special motion five, um, and then followed by eight. Seven, six, nine, one, two, three, and four. Thank you. Is this agreed? Thank you. Items. I called up. Sorry. I called on councillors Alfonso and Pascal Tobel Bora to move and second. Formally moved. Formally second. Formally second. I called on councillor Alfonso, followed by councillor Pascal Tobel Bora to speak for the opposition. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor. With the devastating news that Wandsworth Bridge will be closed for a minimum of 10 weeks, starting on the 24th of July, residents and businesses are rightfully concerned about the impact this will have on their lives and livelihoods. Mayor, there are 63 independent businesses on the Wandsworth Bridge Road and many more on the New Kings Road and in the South Fulham area. These are people who have a deep belief in their community they serve. People who have a desire to bring something new and enduring to our community. And people who every single day are putting their heart into what they do. I have heard firsthand from small business owners that conditions for trading in the area were already difficult, but that they have faced a dramatic decline in business activity since the introduction 
of the South Fulham traffic schemes. With the trial to the west of Wandsworth Bridge Road causing an average a 25% reduction in trading, businesses are having to choose between relocating or closing up shop. Mayor, the row of 20 empty shops on the Wandsworth Bridge Road tells its own story. Cutting off the main route from Wandsworth for a summer will be devastating. But don't just take it from me. Listen to what the businesses are telling us about their struggle to stay afloat. Halley's Cafe, a beloved local business, making huge losses. Katie and Joe, footfall down 20% from January to April. Neptune Kitchens, taking significant losses and are planning to relocate. Koji is having customers cancel regularly because they're stuck in traffic. Preta Vivra, footfall down 70%. Il Pagliaccio, lunchtime trade down 90%. Hector Finch, an iconic Wandsworth Bridge Road business, relocating after 20 years. Alison Rogers, looking to relocate. Hitchcock, closing after many years, resulting in 49 local job losses. West Forth, weekend trade down 38%, and now they're closing. Mayor, this is why we have launched our plan to save South Fulham businesses. Our plan has three key pillars. Number one, support through lo for local businesses through an emergency rebate. Number two, to ensure Wandsworth Council deliver as fast a repair as possible. And number three, to suspend the South Fulham traffic schemes for the duration of the closure. Firstly, local businesses are the lifeblood of our community mayor. We are calling on Labour-run Wandsworth Council to provide funding for a business rebate to remedy the damage that this closure is causing. Secondly, we're calling on Labour-run Wandsworth Council to carry out as fast a repair as possible, including 24-7 works and more staff. As a major arterial route, Wandsworth, the longer Wandsworth Bridge is closed, the longer both our communities suffer. And finally, we call on this administration to suspend the SW6 traffic schemes so people from outside the borough can continue to access our shops and are not discouraged from visiting these local businesses and their family and friends. Mayor, small independent businesses are the lifeblood of our economy here in Hammersmith and Fulham. Having survived COVID and the introduction of the traffic schemes, the closure of Wandsworth Bridge will be catastrophic for businesses in South Fulham. Our plan delivers the temporary reprieve that local businesses need and represents a pragmatic solution to what is a difficult issue. Madam Mayor, in my hand, sorry, Mayor, I have a petition signed by 65 businesses on the Wandsworth Bridge Road demanding action. We call on the administration to put politics aside and back our plan to save South Fulham businesses. Thank you. Can I? Can I? Can I call upon uh, Councillor Pascal Tolper, please? Thank you very much, Mayor. This should be a straightforward debate, not about the history of traffic schemes, not about who said what to whom when, all about solutions to problems. We should, I hope, all be in agreement that the businesses of South Fulham spread across Wandsworth Bridge Road, the New Kings Road and surrounding areas are a real asset. They are local, independent, high quality, and many of them have served Fulham and the neighboring zones for decades, some before many of us were born. Fulham is a better place because of them. Many are here tonight, thank you for coming. They now find themselves through no fault of their own, deeply threatened. Another one, as we heard, went under this week. Mayor, businesses do not want to be political. They want to serve their customers, contribute to their community, and yeah, maybe make a profit. My colleague, Councillor Alfonso, has spoken eloquently of the impact these businesses are already feeling. Does the party opposite really feel comfortable dismissing these as mere political points? Because it is clear that so far, with regret, the administration has not listened, which is why three weeks on from meeting with local businesses, there's just been radio silence. It was really nice to see the administration joining us at the Wadsworth Bridge Road Fair, but we can all take selfies. And a road is for life, 
not to us for the weekend. Refusing to listen. Mayor, refusing to listen to local businesses to, if I may borrow a phrase from the left, their lived experiences is so clearly wrong, so clearly small-minded. But very late in the day, the administration has an opportunity to redeem itself. Because here is a plan that will make life tangibly better for businesses at a moment of maximum stress. Work with your Labour colleagues over the river to get a business rates rebate. Get in place the assurances that the work's done will not take a moment longer than they need to. And for a time limited period, ensure that people from other boroughs can come in and make up the shortfall. We'll help you get the message out because we want our businesses to succeed. When they do well, the borough does well. So you're the ones who hold the power. Get it right and you'll have actually made a difference, which is what I hope we all went into politics for. But failing to take action, Sorry, can you please allow Councillor Pascal Fogel to complete his um, speech? Thank you. Thank you. Um, failing to take action, though, will send a very strong signal that you're not that interested about the well-being of the communities that you serve. And it's a case of sound bites over strategy, politics over practicalities. Power, yes, but without responsibility. I hope you make the right choice. I suspect what I hope will be a matter of profound indifference to you, however, but think also tonight about what people's livelihoods depend on. And please, please do the right thing. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Pascal Fogel, an amendment has. Sorry. An amendment has been submitted for this motion. I call on Councillor Sharon Holder and Ben Coleman to move and second the amendment. Thank you very much, Mayor. Can I just start by... Sorry, yeah. Councillor Holder. Oh. Sorry, Councillor Carmel, you wish to speak. Uh, Mayor, may, may I request that you actually read this out? We get a copy, but the many people in the audience who are here for this uh, do not know what the, uh, the amendment says. Thank you very much. Okay, Councillor Carmel, I will do that. Thank you. Councillors, councillors, members, I'm going to get one of the officers to read it. Um, quite a long piece. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the amendment is as follows. Um, delete after the council and replace with Notes with concern the impending 10 week closure by Wandsworth Council of Wandsworth Bridge due to essential safety work. 
resolves to work constructively with Wandsworth Council to ensure the works are completed as swiftly as possible, recognises the difficulties that the closure will cause for South Fulham businesses already dealing with the worst cost of living crisis in memory caused by the Conservative government's economic failures, welcomes the announcement of the new business visitor access permit which enables businesses to get free access through the clean air neighborhood cameras for shoppers, staff and deliveries. Note that the 60 businesses have already taken advantage of the new business visitor access permit. Around 2000 visits per month have been authorized using the bespoke Ringo codes provided to businesses and business parks from the early days of the trial. Note the introduction of extra shopper parking pays and e-cargo bikes to support businesses and the suspension of the Imperial Road camera to enable visitors without permits to have easier access to Wandsworth Bridge Road businesses during the bridge closure. Notes the continued support of residents for the South Fulham Clean Air neighbourhood and the view of traffic experts that suspending the scheme during the closure of Wandsworth Bridge would lead to large amounts of traffic on residential roads that are benefiting from the Clean Air neighbourhood. Commits to, clo to working closely with the businesses to, to develop further measures to enable customers to access businesses in South Fulham due to the closure of Wandsworth Bridge. Notes the government sets business rates, which councils are required to collect in full and hand over to the government. And that if councils offer rebates, they still have to pay the full sum to the government and therefore calls on the, area, on the area's member of parliament, Greg Hans, to press the government to introduce a targeted business rate relief scheme for the South, South Fulham businesses affected by the Wandsworth Bridge closure. Thank you, Grant. Um, I now invite Councillors Sharon Holder and Ben Coleman to move and second the amendment. Thank you very much indeed, Mayor. Um, again, we welcome the opportunity for the opposition to respond on behalf of local residents impacted by the closure of Wandsworth Bridge. This council notes with grave concern the impending 10 week closure by Wandsworth Council of Wandsworth Bridge due to essential safety work. Safety work that we understand ourselves um, is imperative that we is undertaken when it is needed before anything of any serious nature takes place. We are, however, engaged with our local council colleagues in Wandsworth and we resolve to work constructively with bonds of council to ensure the works are completed as swiftly as is possible. We recognize the difficulties the closures will cause for South Fulham businesses already dealing with the worst cost of living crisis in memory caused by the conservative government's economic failures. This Labour Council welcomes the announcement of the new business visitor access permit which enables businesses to give free access through the clean air neighbourhood cameras for shoppers, staff and deliveries. As has been said before, 60 businesses have already taken advantage of the new business visitor access permit and around 2,000 visitors per month have been authorised using the best boat Ringo codes provided to businesses and business parks from the early days of the trial. The introduction of extra shopper parking bays and e-cargo bikes helps to support businesses and the suspension of the Imperial Road camera enables visitors without permits to have easier access to Wandsworth to Wandsworth Bridge Road um, businesses during the bridge closure. There is considerable continued support of residents for the South Fulham Clean Air neighbourhood and the view of traffic experts that suspending the scheme during the close of Wandsworth Bridge would lead to large amounts of traffic on residential roads that are already benefiting from the clean air neighbourhood. So, sorry, sorry, Councillor Holder, I will not tolerate heckling while a councillor is speaking. If anybody wants to, any councillor wants to speak, you will indicate to me and I will allow you to speak. Please do not heckle. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We've, we further pledge to continue working closely with businesses as we have already done so far and will continue to do. And for the record, we do intend 
to respond to all of those businesses and have a meeting with them. And dates are currently being considered consider at this very moment in time, okay? Um, so the council notes that the government, however, sets business rates and requires councils to collect them in full on behalf of, on their behalf, sorry, and calls on area, the area's member for parliament, Greg Hans, to pressure government himself um, to introduce a targeted business rate relief scheme for businesses impacted by the bridge's closure, which in his position, he should be able to do fairly easy. Thank you. I'll call upon Councillor Ben Coleman to speak. Yeah, thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Look, I think one thing we all agree on both sides of the house is that we believe in business. Okay, And there's quite a lot of what you said that I, I wholeheartedly support. Businesses, small businesses are the lifeblood of any economy. I've actually spent my whole political career, eccentric though you may, may think, is trying to develop policy to support small business, from raising capital to ac and access to finance, to um, dealing with the problem of late payment and the whole range of other areas, training many, many areas. I've, I've even managed to get a version of chapter 11 in the first Labour government under Tony Blair's um, <laughs> first, what they did in the first term. And one of the first meetings I had as um, when I was chairing the, when just after being elected in 2014, when I was chairing the uh, Committee for Economic Re Regeneration and Housing and the Arts, was actually in Wandsworth Bridge Road with Wandsworth Bridge Road businesses at their invitation back in 2014 to talk about how tough business was and what could be done to try and help boost it. Um, and we have tried work on a number of things since then, and you'll be aware that there are no, for example, even recently, there are lots of new parking places coming in and, and many things, but it, it has always, it's been tough for a long time in that road, and I know that. And that, and and it's it, nobody who's, who lives in that area, who works in that area, who runs a business in that area, I think would disagree, although maybe some, but there are many who'd agree with this. We've also tried to do many things as administration, you're aware of, you've enjoyed coming down to North End Road, where we've done these regular um, closing of the roads and, and big markets, and that's been good, at, not just at supporting local businesses, and I was talking to the um, tattoo shop there, and they said they were doing <laughs> roaring trade on the day, um, which is pleasing, it's pleasing to hear, um, small, uh, the, the, the summer fair in Wandsworth Bridge Road, where we enabled the road to be shut, we provided all the security and all the other arrangements for the day, um, that was also good for businesses I hear, um, including the, the local butchers who did a, a fantastic trade doing delicious um, burgers and so on, so we are, there are many, many other things, and I think that's right, so well, I, I, I didn't buy a burger, but other people said they were doing a good trade and they had to queue a long time, so I'm reading from that that they did a good trade, they did a good day's trade, the thing is, we so we support businesses, and I don't think we're not we're talking about which side supports businesses more. I think we're talking here about why businesses are having such a tough time. And, and I'm very clear that what you're saying is that businesses are having a tough time because of the clean air neighborhood brought into South Fulham on both sides of Wandsworth Bridge Road. I'm very clear that's what you're saying. Yes. And I'm very and I'm And I'm very and I'm very clear. I'm very clear that that many people in this room would agree with you. And also that we are not allowed to talk about the worst cost of living crisis in living memory. We're not allowed to talk about soaring inflation. We're not allowed to talk about the impact of energy bills shooting up. We're not allowed to talk about rents going up and wage deflation. We're not allowed to talk about the terrifying rise in mortgage interest rates, something like average of twelve thousand pounds across Chelsea and Fulham. So we're not allowed to talk about the impact of those on business in the borough and across the country, we are only allowed to talk about the stated impact of the traffic and this clean air neighborhood on businesses. And I'm saying we need to talk about everything and we need to talk about everything and we need to look at the evidence. Now, there is a lot of very understandable uh, personal evidence, which we're hearing from businesses. There's also a lot of data, which I think we need to look at so we can take an evidence-based approach. And I'm very sure that my, co my colleague here, Councillor Holden and officers will be providing and working through that data with businesses. But we also have to take account of the fact that there are a lot of residents who are very worried at the moment. And they're very worried because they think the council is being asked to abandon the trial. And they're writing to us. I'm, I'm amazed how many dozens of letters we've had in the last couple of weeks because they're genuinely frightened that the trial will be abandoned. They're, right, they're talking about how they like the improved safety for their children, for cyclists, how they like the better air, how they like the way they can drive in and out of residential streets, how there's less traffic on neighbourhood streets. I've got, for example, if I could just quote a couple of people, someone who lives in Clancarty Road, our quality of life has meaningfully improved since the scheme was put in place. We'd be very frustrated if this was to change. Living on Broomhouse Lane, 
says so somebody else, we've noticed that, I, I, I think it's worth, we've noticed the huge reduction in people running and speeding through the neighborhood, and it's made the whole area a lot safer. And indeed, from business owner, since the implementation of the Clean Air Neighborhood Scheme, I received overwhelming feedback. This is someone who says this to us, from local residents who've expressed their appreciation for the cleaner and safer roads in the area. So I think the trial is, as far as residents are concerned, if we're going to come to a way forward on this, we can't make this about businesses or about residents. We have to work together as a community. And as far as residents are concerned, it is a huge success. And I hear what you're saying about businesses not saying it's a huge success. I, and I'm going on the basis of the, I think, 60 emails that we've been sent in the last couple of weeks alone. And when these people are saying that, for example, there's been an incredible reduction in air pollution, the traffic, when these people are saying Councilor the traffic... Cold, man. Councilor Cold, please allow me to be to members of the public. I'm so sorry. Thank you. I wish to remind residents that this is a public meeting. We have a big agenda to get through. Um, I appreciate that they've travelled here, um, but please do not interrupt councillors when they're speaking. You've had your chance of um, public questions. People that haven't had a response, I would ensure that they get a response. But please allow members on both sides to address and finish the meeting in an appropriate manner. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It would be entirely wrong for any of us in this room and talking to everybody to dismiss the concerns that businesses have expressed. It would equally be entirely wrong to dismiss the things that residents are saying. And I hope as we move forward that we'll be able to find a solution that works for everyone and doesn't pit one sort of group against another group because the residents are delighted I'm with the sorry, same largely. And let's take it from there. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I've been informed that councillors Rowan Lee and councillor Stephen Carroll wish to speak. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. Um, I am speaking uh, in support of the amendments to this motion. Uh, this is a, uh, a, long, uh, a long amendment with, um, with lots of meaningful activity in that will help uh, businesses in the area. Uh, I believe it's uh, an amendment that's put forward in a spirit of cooperation, something that um, is aiming to improve the experience uh, and is not a, a political point scoring exercise. I did want to speak briefly on the business rates point. I noticed that one of the three points in the uh, the opposition's plan is that uh, the council should uh, provide a rebate on business rates for businesses in the area. Well, that's not actually something that the council has the power to do. What, uh, where businesses are affected by local disruption, uh, they are able to contact the valuation office agency who can consider the circumstances and provide temporary reductions in the rateable values of those properties or those businesses. Um, the council will be providing additional information for businesses in the area. Uh, so that they're able to uh, to do this, to get in touch with the valuation office and uh, and make those representations on their behalf. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call on Councillor Colin. Uh, th thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, th thank you to everybody who has come tonight to raise the concerns of their businesses. Um, I understand that in a pluralistic society, people are going to get given lots of different information. And some of that information is going to be correct. Some of it is not going to be correct. Some of that is genuine misunderstanding. Some of that is deliberate misrepresentation. And what we have to do in government, in local government, is to try and juggle all the different objectives. Let me give you an assurance right at the front of this. Throughout the time we've been in office, supporting and helping small businesses grow and thrive has been at the heart of what we've tried to do. And if you look at the figures, if you look at the business growth in different parts of the borough, at a time of unprecedented change to our economy, whether it's Amazon reshaping the retail market, or whether it's the cost of living crisis reshaping people's disposable income, there are challenges throughout, and we recognize that small businesses are important. And that's why we have done a number of different actions 
I won't quote tonight. What I can assure you is that if whatever the problems are, what we want to do is to focus on the evidence of the problems and come up with solutions. That is a guarantee that this administration wants to do. And if you're open to talking with our people, we will throw resources at this because we are determined. We are, this, look, can I just, can I, can I just, can I just, can I just read, this is a democratic forum. If you don't mind, Madame, this is not a chance for people to shout out. If you want to, I, I will talk if you like. There's public meetings of all different types, whether it's our policy and accountability meetings, but I don't think a shouting match or there's one bloke with his hand up. This is not a public question time. This is a public debate. And I welcome the people coming here, but there were questions and there are other question forums, not least the policy and accountability committees, which can look at these things in detail. So I make an offer. If people are willing to work with our officials and look at the problems, I promise you we will focus on the solutions. That's the direction from Councillor Coleman. It's the direction from me. It's at the heart of what we believe in about having a strong, vibrant borough. Strong, vibrant boroughs mean strong, independent businesses. And that's why we've gone out of our way to support them. Now, I would just ask you to, um, to recognize that we've done that over the last nine years. When we closed North End Road to do a uh, market fair, where we gave free stores to startup entrepreneurs and we gave free stores to all the businesses in North End Road, we did not get support from the opposition. We got attacked as it was anti-car. But if you talk to those North End businesses, their takings went up sometimes 50%. One business I spoke to on that day did 100% of trade in one day for that month. Um, so we are always going to look at different measures to support different businesses, as you see on the North End Road example or the King Street example. The same with the Wandsworth Bridge Road closure and the fair. That was Councillor Coleman's initiative, having worked in supporting small businesses for his whole political career. Now, we want to look at that data because people are saying, well, this restaurant's takings are down 20 percent. Well, I can tell you, we talked to the hospitality industry. There's a lot of different reasons for that. Is it because there's a cleaner neighborhood that limits people cutting through? Not people wanting to visit the restaurant, not people wanting to visit their friends, but people using the streets as a cut through. Now you might say, well, why would the council do that? Well, as you heard earlier, we work very closely with the health services. We, we heard earlier a professor got an uh, honor from in the recent birthday honors, was a, res a professor of respiratory diseases. When I meet, when Ben meets with these doctors and scientists who are our partners day in, day out, they will tell us about air pollution and its causes on dementia, cancer, heart disease, and they will say, what are you doing? And so we are trying to come up with something more imaginative in low traffic neighborhoods, one that limits cut through traffic but doesn't stop visitors, one that encourages people to visit and has less uh, congestion, but at the same time is good for business. And we may not have got all that right. And I can see that the number of people here today don't think we have. What I am saying to you is we will work harder to try and get it right if you're saying it's not right. We will focus on the facts, not on the noise. And I understand why. I mean, I would say when Wandsworth Bridge closed a few years ago under a conservative administration, just just what one, one, one when okay, not a squeak from these guys, but we will listen. Are there any other speakers on the amendment, please? Councillor Dinsmore, you wish to speak? Uh, thank you, Mayor. It's uh, just a really simple, practical point. I mean, I welcome all the comments um, supporting local businesses and thank business owners for joining us today. Obviously, you've got the um, business visitor access permit, so you must accept that the Clean Air neighbourhood has an impact on business and you therefore have to pass for it. But the problem with these passes is that the Ringo app is difficult to use. I'm in all sorts of residence groups and people are being issued penalty notices when they think they've signed up, et cetera, et cetera. And the ultimate reality is it will have a chilling effect on visitors if they think they have to get a special visitor's pass. If you just suspended the scheme, 
for the period of the bridge closure. It's a very simple, very clear message. The businesses will be able to send their visitors and will have the same effect in theory as the visitors pass. It's just less admin, less chance of people getting it wrong, and there'll be less of a chilling effect. So I would re reiterate that it would be better to suspend the scheme for this period than add another level of bureaucracy on top of it. Thank you. Thank you. I now, I now put the amendment to the vote. Those in favour, right. please raise your hands. Those against, please raise your hands. Those not, those not voting. I hereby announce the outcome of the voting. Four thirty-two against ten, and nobody not not voting zero. The amendment. The amendment is carried. Mm. Are there, yeah. Yeah, are there any other speakers? Are there any other speakers? No. Mm. Uh, I now call upon yeah. Councillor Afton. Sorry, Afonso. Nobody's suffering. Thank you, Mayor. To, to sum up. Mayor, this is an administration in denial. Tonight, we put a motion before full council that was very simple. It was a very small ask. I'm going to spend a minute, the meeting for two minutes. I'm I'm suspending the minute, the meeting for five minutes.
Hello. Um, I'm going to start the meeting again. Um, I just need to know, is the amended the motion agreed? Oh, sorry, I called upon Councillor Alf uh, Alfonso to sum up. Thank you, Mayor. As I was saying, this is an administration in denial. Councillor Coleman speaks of 60 emails. I speak of 65 businesses on one road. They speak, they speak of opening Imperial Road, which shows that you actually can pause the cameras. This was not a big ask. Our plan is 10 weeks. That is the duration of the closure of Wandsworth Bridge. A 10 week pause to the trial to the west of Wandsworth Bridge Road. And tonight you have told businesses their livelihoods, no. You have said your livelihood is not worth me as, or you guys as administration, pausing a scheme for 10 weeks. This could destroy lives. Yeah, yeah. On business rates, on business rates, there is no need to make this a formal business rates rebate. You are making plenty of money in fines. Why not do it as a lump sum? You have very talented officers. I am sure they can come up with a scheme. And on working constructively with One's Earth, I welcome that. But can I ask you, why is it, if your plan is to keep businesses aware, that you didn't meet with them until they requested a meeting? Why is it that they've had to wait three weeks to schedule another? And why is it with 12 days left until the closure of Wandsworth Bridge that only two days ago, people received news on how they can travel, on buses? What have you done as a council? Nothing. You're letting businesses down, you're letting residents down, and frankly, you should be ashamed of yourselves. Is, 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 the, is the amended motion agreed? No, and we're calling for names on the vote. Get out of the Will councillors please indicate how they wish to vote on the on the motion? Oh, sorry, on the amendment. On the, on the, sorry, on the motion. On the motion as amended. On the motion as amended. Um, once I call your names, Councillor Alexander. Antonides.
Councillor Brown. Councillor Campbell Simon. Councillor Shavok Ferdier. Oh. Councillor Coleman. Oh. Councillor Collins. Oh. Councillor Cowan. Oh. Councillor Daly. Councillor Harcourt. Oh. Councillor Holder. Councillor Homan. Councillor Jaynes. Councillor Jones. No, I do apologise. Councillor Kwan. Councillor Lang. Councillor Melton. Councillor Miri. Councillor Morton. Not present. Councillor Noir Beb. Councillor Patel. Councillor Perez. Councillor Ree. Councillor Richardson. Councillor Robottom. Councillor Sanderson. Councillor Schmidt. Councillor Taylor. Councillor Trey. Councillor Ume Francis. Councillor Ume Mercy. Councillor Vaughan. Councillor Walsh. Councillor Afonso. Again. Councillor Axel Hines. Against. Councillor Alford. Okay. Councillor Borland. Against. Councillor Brock Bankala. Against. Councillor Dinsmore. Against. Councillor Kamau. Against. Councillor Lloyd Harris. Against. Councillor Cascu Tolbert. Against. Councillor Stanton. Against. Item 6.45, um, the motion as amended, I, I hereby announce the outcome of the voting. 4, 31 against 10. The motion as amended is carry, carried. Thank you. Item 6.8, special motion eight, celebrating the wish the Windrush generation. I call upon Councillor Sha Sharon Holder and Mercy Ume to move and second. Thank you, Madam Mayor or Mayor. Second, it is with immense pride that on the 22nd of June, as the Council's Cabinet Member for Public Realm and Culture, this administration celebrated 75 years for the pioneering Windrush generation coming to Britain. A generation my parents are part of, having come to Britain in the 1960s, moving to Hammersmith and Fulham in 1963, when I was, where I was born, educated, married, and now enables this administration to govern. The Windrush celebration was our way of thanking all those who helped to make Britain what it is today, economically, socially, and culturally. Joined by colleagues, this council gave thanks to the Windrush generation who came from the Caribbean to help Britain rebuild its battered economy after the Second World War. Gave thanks to the many thousands of Caribbean men and women who had previously volunteered to serve on the um, in the British Armed Forces during the Second World War. 
gave thanks to those of the Windrush generation who played an invaluable role serving in the newly established NHS. Gave thanks to those of the Windrush generation who brought iconic jazz, soca, reggae and dance to the UK, greatly contributing to the British culture, some might even say change British music forever. We gave thanks to the many members of the Windrush generation who made their homes in Hammersmith and Fulham, contributing greatly to the area's economic, public services and culture. The council further gave thanks to the extraordinary resilience of this pioneering generation who face discrimination, not only when they first arrived, but also up to and through the period marked by the Home Office's pernicious hostile environment policy, which led to the injustice known as the Windrush scandal, where many found themselves unable to work, rent properties, denied NHS healthcare, and even deported. And in justice, this Conservative government has still not fully compensated victims for. Children of the Windrush generation who travelled to Britain on their parents' passports and were therefore legally resident in the UK deserved better than its government. Huge credit was also given to the Windrush generation's descendants, many of whom, like me, raised in Hammersmith and Fulham, make a difference in society, like the CEO of Newbin Life Charity, based in White City, Jazz Brown, who with her team transported the borough's Windrush generation residents to the celebration, some over 90 years old, and the teachers who brought the over 350 Hammersmith and Fulham school children to perform at the event from dance, singing and playing in steel bands on what was an extremely hot day. Our hope is that this generation will achieve even more progress than we have and make the pioneer and Windrush generation proud of having come to Britain. But sadly, Windrush has become synonymous with injustice and the Windrush scandal. So to this end, um, future Windrush anniversaries will be tainted by the negative experience some endured throughout the Windrush scandal. This council calls on the government to pay the long overdue compensation to victims of the Windrush scandal and ensure that British people of colour will never again be singled out and victimised by the very state meant to protect and serve them. I move. Thank you. Councillor Ume. Councillor Ume. You wish thank to speak? Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. June, 2nd June of this year, March 75 years anniversary of Windrush Generation. Okay. This was celebrated. Councillor Ume, have you got your mic on? I can't yes. hear you. You can't hear me. Okay, sorry. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you. Can you hear me now? Okay. I can. Thank you. Thank you. June 22nd of this year marked 75 years anniversary of Windrush generation. This was celebrated in various parts of the borough, including Shepherd's Bush Green. We had a lot of residents, steel band speakers, including 300 school children and their teachers who attended and danced on the day. This was to remember the immense contribution each and every single member of this generation had made and continue to make in our amazing and diverse community and wider society. The arrival marked a new chapter in British history, bringing their skills, vibrant culture, traditions to our nation, which helped to enrich our society by adding diverse flavor to our music, food, arts, literature, Many members of Windrush settled in Hammersmith and Fulham, contributing in various areas of the borough, making their works and contribution in some of this, um, uh, in some of this, making contribution in various areas of this of, and the economy of this culture. We have installed a lot of blue 
plaques around the borough, marking the works and contribution of some of these individuals from Windrush generation. Their dedication to healthcare was unique. They worked tirelessly in hospitals across the country and Hammersmith and Fulham, providing quality care to patients and becoming the backbone of NHS, which celebrated its 75 years anniversary last week. Their commitments to excellency, compassion, and duty set a shining example for the future generation. However, it is crucial to acknowledge their journey. The journey of Winrod generation has not been without its challenges. Despite their significant contribution, they faced diversity and discrimination. They fought it all. They stood tall, providing their, proving their strength and, and, and perseverance time and time again. And their experience served as a, a reminder for the importance of equality, fairness, and compassion. The establishment of Winrod's compensation scheme was a step towards acknowledging the immense suffering inflicted upon the Windrush generation. However, it's evidence that the current scheme fell short in delivering the justice that these individuals rightly deserve. It lacks transparency, fairness, effectiveness, maintaining in effect the very system that victimized them. This generation suffered harm, lost opportunities due to, one, due to wrongful deportation, detention, denial, denial of basic rights. I refer to two residents from my ward that came to see me because their benefit and medical treatment were canceled. The, com uh, the compensation scheme must be designed to address the diverse range of losses suffered and consider financial, emotional, collective impact opposed being mainly on a mechanism for financial restriction. The current compensation scheme is random and inadequate, failed to fully address harm, address some afflicted on the victims and their families. We must demand a fair and comprehensive uh, compensation framework. To achieve this objective, we must advocate for a thorough review and reform of the Windrush, uh, Windrush Compensation Scheme. In conclusion, the Windrush scandal represents a dark chapter in British history. Collectively, we have, sorry. Collectively, we have a moral obligation to rectify the wrongs of the past, ensure that such injustice are never repeated. Let us all call upon this government to reform the Windrush uh, compensation scheme, making it a transparent, fair, purposeful, together we can work towards a future where equality, justice, and respect are afforded to all, regardless of their color of their skin. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. I've been informed that councillors Lang, Lloyd Towers, Florian, Bollard, Bollard, uh, Patel, Afonso, and Sala wish to speak. Can I call upon Councillor Lang, please? Thank you very much. Um, Mayor, I want to speak in support of this motion celebrating the Windrush generation and in full support of councillors Holder and Umez's leadership on this very important issue. And in doing so, celebrate the 75th anniversary, Windrush Day itself, the Windrush generation, and in particular, the Windrush generation and elders and their families in Hammersmith and Fulham. But in this celebration, it is vital to recognise the terrible injustices of the Windrush scandal and the pernicious impacts of the Conservative government's hostile environment policy. Three weeks ago, I was proud as a Hammersmith and Fulham resident 
and local Brook Green councillor to join with many different groups within our diverse and dynamic community on Shepherd's Bush Green to celebrate Windrush Day. <clears throat> there on stage, we saw our Windrush elders, local Hammersmith and Fulham primary and secondary children enthusiastically sharing their songs and poems, some specially written for the day, and our civic leaders, including you, Mayor, and the leader of the council, all demonstrating leadership on this key issue. And a couple of weeks earlier, on another stage in Shepherd's Bush, I had seen Sir Lenny Henry's remarkable debut as a playwright, August in England, gaining five star reviews. The play was moving, tragic, angry, and as you'd expect with Lenny Henry, humorous. One line I particularly liked was, have you seen Theresa May dance? That's a hostile environment. <laughs> the play ended though with telling documentary testimony from three people whose lives and families' lives had been ruined by the scandal. So I want to applaud Councillors Holder and Umer, the council officers team, especially the events team for staging Hammersmith and Fulham Windrush Day and other significant celebrations of our community in its life, including the Nabea and Jack Council celebrations last year for Island Records of Bob Marley in St Peter's Square in Hammersmith, and more recently, the celebration for Greensleeve Records on Shepherd's Bush Green, another great and well-attended special event. So what joins all these together is the amazing resilience of the pioneering generation and the commitment that no British citizen, in this case, British citizens of colour, should ever, ever be victimised by the people who are meant to protect and serve them. And our community demonstrated leadership, leadership from the Windrush community, from the Windrush elders and their families, from young people in Hammersmith and Fulham, their schools and their teachers, from council officers and from this Labour Council. Mayor, from time to time, I dip into one of my favourite books. Apparently, it's also a favourite book of the Secretary of State for levelling up. One thing we will agree on, I sadly, nothing else. But sadly, he does not seem to have gleaned any lessons from its 700 pages. The book is The Passage of Power by Robert Caro. It's about Lyndon Johnson, whose reputation and place in history are rightly scarred by the Vietnam War. But it is, and it's a very big but, he was instrumental in framing and passing civil rights legislation in 1964 America. Two days after the assassination of Kennedy, he was in a meeting late into the night when his advisors were telling him it's going to be his first speech the next day to Congress as president, not to mention civil rights. They were arguing about it. And at the end of the evening, one of the what's called the, the senior advisors apparently came to him and said to him face to face, President, you should spend your time and power not on lost causes, no matter how worthy these causes might be. Now, excuse my Texan accent. He replied, well, what the hell's the presidency for then? <laughs> and then next day he spoke and he talked, he said this, we have talked long enough in this country on equal rights. It's now time to write the next chapter and to write it in the books of law. That was leadership. We haven't seen that from our conservative government on the Windrush scandal, or indeed on the illegal migrants bill. But I'm proud to be fully supporting the leadership given by Councillor Holder and Councillor Ume in proposing this extremely important motion. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, I believe all in this council chamber, irrespective of political allegiance, will recognize and support the achievements that this generation and their families have brought to this country. I feel that we owe them an apology for how many were treated and thank them for their contribution in making this country a more inclusive one. Without their hard work in many professions, especially the NHS, we would have struggled. 
I feel that unfortunately many suffered a similar fate as those who emigrated to Australia back in the 1950s under the 10 pound POM scheme. The sense of being accepted, of belonging, of being treated with respect was not felt by many. And to this day, there are still families who suffer due to grandparents' lack of documentation. I've been involved locally with the Windrush generation since 2018, when I was asked to give a presentation on the very issue, having turned up at Nage UK, an older people's con consultative forum in uh, Hammersmith. We ran workshops and arranged the home office to attend to help deal with residents' lack of doc documentation and fear of being returned home if they were found to be lacking evidence to stay. The Home Office's Windrush team sat down and helped residents with their documentation and relatives that were acting on behalf usually of their grandparents. We managed to attract what is known as, many of you will understand this one, too hard to reach community who would hopefully benefit from the support. I was asked to contact the Chief Executive Council as the Home Office were offering the borough a team to be installed in the Town Hall to help residents. I was asked to propose the offer, which I thought would be willingly accepted, but it was declined on the grounds that we didn't have sufficient numbers to warrant them. We were the second borough offered a Windrush team, the first being Greenwich, who eagerly accepted the offer. I feel we missed an opportunity to help our residents. Clearly the Home Office thought we had the numbers and Andy Slaughter told me at the meeting he had 108 cases he was working on. A missed opportunity, but now we have a chance to make good on these previous mistakes. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my first words go to you to congratulate you on your election and to the Deputy Mayor and to thank your predecessor for all her hard work. Um, it's been an incredible few months together already, uh, and I can't wait for more to shed the light on all that remains to be done to deliver true equality for all. And thank you for taking me under your wing on this journey of humility and discovery and understanding. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge, it hasn't been a fun few weeks for the French community, as many of us have been worrying about loved ones and family in France, with the riots. Um, so I was wondering whether members would be kind enough to switch their Duolingos on to allow me to wish my compatriots a très bonne fête nationale and vive la France. Now, West Kensington, like many other areas, has benefited from centuries of migration. Some very notable and remarkable individuals have moved over and made West Kensington their homes. They include singer-songwriter Estelle, whose mother moved uh, to West Kent from Senegal, Mahatma Gandhi, Adelaide Hall, who sang with Duke Ellington, and Joe McCunyata, who became Kenya's first prime minister and president. But the Windrush Review left no room for doubt. It said, I quote, the government exhibited ignorance and thoughtlessness, failed to address foreseeable and avoidable issues, and made irrational demands for documents. In essence, it invited individuals to our country without providing them with any documentation, only to later expel them on that very basis. At a recent event organized by the Three Million in Parliament, I discussed on behalf of our borough and the Labour Party, how the government has chosen to repeat that with the EU settlement scheme. Of course, no conservative present on that panel, I can't imagine this was because the House was voting on the Johnson report. I assume they're all looking for Taylor Swift tickets. But, but those of us who actually turned up, bothered to turn up, heard profoundly distressing testimonies. And I'll tell you some. Alicia, a mother of three, who was repeatedly denied welfare and made homeless due to the Home Office taking one year to confirm her immigration status. Denisa, who shared how the Roma community have been threatened with deportation because of applications in limbo. Agnieszka, who recounted how a technical error, error that displayed someone else's face on her profile led to her termination and years of unemployment. Remember the conclusions of the Windrush report? <coughs> the government's ignorance and thoughtlessness 
the failures to prevent foreseeable and avoidable problems and the irrational demands to establish residency rights? Worldwide countries like Japan, Australia, China, India, and the US are moving past old paper documents and into the future with universal digital identity wallets. Lawful UK residents have to rely on an antiquated technical solution that puts them at risk of exclusion and deportation. So in conclusion, if we were, if we were part of the EU or in a sectoral cooperation like Horizon with the EU, we could actively shape the future digital identity wallet, EIDAS2. And that means that with it, overseas citizens could start their identity journeys in their countries and could come over here with a credential about their migration status issued by the Home Office, which could be displayed on a scannable QR code with the added benefit of reducing cost, fraud, and risks. But we're not around that table, and the government is oblivious to technological progress. So Britain is left as a rule taker in this area. Mayor, we are witnessing another Windrush type scandal unfold, which boosts hardworking, tax paying migrants at an unfair disadvantage. They experience stress, anxiety, exclusion, and it diminishes our nation's attractiveness. It exacerbates labor shortages and keeps us locked into stagflation. So this Labour Council will continue to do what it has done over the years, which is to fight for every single citizen's rights and residents' rights to make sure this tired and out of touch conservative party that can't understand modern technology and puts its destructive ideology before all else is relegated to the history books. Thank you. Thank you. I call, I call on Councillor Borland, speak please. Thank you, Mayor. The UK, and in particular London, is like a patchwork quilt. Pieces of different people's cultures, histories, experiences, and futures all woven together to create a vibrant and successful community. The Britain of 1948 was a very different country to the one we see today. We had just lost 384,000 soldiers and 40,000 civilians. During the seven month period of the Blitz bombing, nearly 20,000 civilians died in London alone. Around 6,000 brave men and women from the Caribbean colonies of the British Commonwealth volunteered for service in the British Armed Forces. And we all give thanks for those who sacrificed their lives to protect our freedoms. The Second World War woke people up to the full horror of what man is capable of inflicting on fellow man, from the beaches to the skies to the gas chambers. The world was in shock. And in the wake of this, Britain put a call out across the Commonwealth for help to rebuild the country. And between 1948 and 1973, 550,000 people of the Windrush generation answered that call and ventured to make the UK their home. The Windrush generation transformed the arts, music and food, as well as the economy and um, many other literary um, achievements. And we see their impact all over London. Growing up, in Notting, growing up in London, Notting Hill Carnival was a highlight of the year with bright colours, joyous music, fabulous dancing and delicious food. London feels truly alive over Carnival weekend. <laughs> Calypso musician Aldwyn Roberts, aka Lord Kitchener, arrived on the Empire Windrush in 1948 and sang to news cameras on his arrival. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to break into song, but I will read you some of his words. London is the place for me. London, this lovely city. You can go to France or America, India, Asia, or Australia, but you must come back to London City. Robert speaks of the mother country later in the song, and there was a widespread feeling amongst new arrivals that they were coming home. The UK was incredibly lucky to have their help and contribution to rebuilding Britain's economy and arts. And now there was no shortage of jobs in industries such as National Rail and the NHS, and a lot of public transport recruited almost exclusively from Jamaica and Barbados. These people quickly became integral to the UK in all walks of life, but sadly they were not wholly welcomed into Britain and faced many adversities. In 2018 and 2019, the Home Office set out to review the cases of 11,800 people who had been detained or removed from the UK. 
it took it, it looked at cases of around 2000 Caribbean nationals to assess whether they'd been in the UK before 1973 and had been caught up in the compliant environment. According to the 2011 census, there were 57,000 people who had arrived from the UK from a Commonwealth country that had not yet applied for a passport and therefore might potentially find it difficult to prove their residency. The Wendy Williams report into the scandal states that the Home Office initially identified 164 people in the country before 1973 who had either been detained or removed or both since 2002 and estimated that it was most likely to have acted wrongly in 18 of these cases by not recognising their right to be in the UK. Sadly, this continued on from 2002 until it came to light. Now, I think we're all aware of mistakes that have been made by successive governments since 2002, and it saddens me that anyone who comes to this country to call it home would be mistreated or be made to feel unwelcome. A number of Home Secretaries have made personal apologies on behalf of governments to those affected, and many less apology have been issued since the issue came to light. The Home Office continues to make improvements to the Windrush Compensation Scheme. Over 3,000 people have applied to the Compensation Scheme, and I would encourage anyone eligible to do so too. 75 years after the arrival of the Empire Windrush at Tilbury Docks, it is wonderful to celebrate the huge contribution these people have made to the UK and Hammersmith and Fulham in particular, and I would like to offer my personal thanks and gratitude to them all. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. I, I call on Councillor Patel to speak. Councillor Patel. Thank you, Mayor. May I please <coughs> follow and congratulate you on your appointment as a mayor. I would also like to uh, say a few words about your predecessor and the hard work which she did as a mayor as well and I shall follow her future career with interest. What has what's been said on this subject uh, by other speakers, I shall not repeat. 21st of June, 1948, that was the date when after 30 days at sea, the Empire Windrush sailed into port at Tilbury. It was a date that will live in infamy and it is a stain on the national character of this country. Councillor Patel, I'm sorry to interrupt. Could you speak up a bit, please? Yes. Thank you. As I said, the 21st of June, 2048, a date that will live in infamy, and is a date which will stain the national character of this country. The ship carried 482 Caribbean immigrants, many of them veterans from the Second World War. And I agree with every sentiment which has been expressed in this motion by councillors Hola and you, Mayor. Unlike the previous speakers who've, who've spoken on this point or on this motion, I have first-hand experience of not being on the, Windru on the uh, uh, Windrush ship, but I have a first-hand experience of the events and what it was like in this country 15 years after 1948. I came to this country, I came to this country, Mayor, in 1963 as a small child. Uh, I was born in Kenya, and the British colonies in East Africa were under the uh, armed rebellion by the Kikuyu and Maasai tribes. My father made a decision that it was time to come to our motherland 5,000 miles away, and we were promised by the British Kenyan authorities that we were coming to Utopia, and we would receive equal treatment in terms of employment and education. So there we were, November 1963, on a cold, dark evening at Heathrow in London, when I slowly realized the reality, very much similar situation to those brave people from the Caribbean who were on the Windrush ship. My first impression of, uh, of, of this country, uh, in those days, for some reason, uh, especially flights which came in from Nairobi or Kenya. They did not have these cover you have at Heathrow Airport. You were made to walk downstairs in the full flight, in the full sight of the cameras. The first impression I got, apart from the grayness of the place, was the let, for let signs. In those days, and this is almost 15 years after the Windrush uh, uh, ship arrived in this country, there were signs on 
properties to be let with words blacks, wogs, and Irish do not apply. Seriously, I'm not joking. I remember that as a boy of some four years old. Uh, there was open racial discrimination in the streets, TV, uh, public institutions until the Racialization Act were enacted in 1965-68 by the Labour government of Harold, Harold Wilson. My first experience was at the school. My two brothers and myself were the first Asians to enroll in our local school. A fellow by the name of Ray Wilkinson stands out in my memory. He was a good looking chap with a blonde hair and clear blue eyes, but I learned from him the first hand, at first hand the intimidation and harassment and force which the fascist group known as the skinheads was so quick to use. He wore bomber jackets and Martin and Dr. Martin boots and was quick to respond to any, any kind of anything he didn't like. He was clearly a boy to be avoided at school breaks and after, after school. I did receive support from the other students at my school, especially the, from the West Indian community. But as far as the other white children were concerned, they became a group of what I would call silent onlookers. They remained silent in the face of brutality. They remained silent in the face of harassment. They remained silent and turned a blind eye to open color discrimination. The school I was with taught me a lot of things, but one thing which I learned under tragic circumstances was how the world is a much worse place when those who choose to do nothing and turn a blind eye than those who actively challenge and engage with a bully. I, I say that it is now time, and not simply by legislation, but putting into action, that all people should be judged by the contents of their character and not by the color of their skin. And I say this not for any self gratification or personal gain, but for, but for the idea of the United Carol. Kingdom. Time is up. Thank you. Thank you. I call Councillor Scarlett to speak, please. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much, everyone who's already spoken. It's been very good. Um, it has been 75 years since the Empire Windrush docked at Tilbury, Essex in June 48, carrying passengers from the Caribbean to fill labour shortages in the UK. This month, our borough hosted several events to celebrate this significant anniversary, culminating in the 75th anniversary celebrations on Brook Green. Growing up in West London in the 70s and 80s, I was not as aware as I should have been of the history of the Windrush generation. It was only as a young adult that I became aware of the enormous impact and lasting contribution that this generation has had in the shaping of modern Britain and indeed the place that it has today. I feel extremely grateful to celebrate with you here the, the ways that some people in my, have, have impacted my life from the Windrush generation. Thank you to those who, all, who came to Britain from the Caribbean, invited by the government following the Second World War to help rebuild the country. Filled with hopes and fears, many on arrival found that they had nowhere to live. 230 people were placed in temporary accommodation in air raid shelters in underground tunnels for several weeks. This was an appalling welcome and show of hostility. We give thanks to the resilience of all who suffered discrimination when they first arrived here, for those skilled workers who couldn't find jobs in their professions and were forced to take lower paid work to survive and provide for their families. Many wanted to return home, as London streets were certainly not paved with gold, but they chose to stay. Some chose to stay too, because sadly, because they were embarrassed to tell the disheartening truths of the hardships their family, to their families back home that they were suffering. Thank you to all those who helped build the, build the NHS, to doctors, nurses and midwives. I want to give special mention to our family health visitor and long-term NHS worker in Hammersmith and Fulham, Christine Fortune, who works at Richard Gate Surgery. Across her long career, Christine gave me and many other but nervous first-time mothers some sage, advi and sage advice and reassurance. She reassured me that one day my babies would sleep through the night and that I would get my life back. 
And it is better to make a beeline for the park with the children when the sun is shining rather than stay at home and tidy up. So I took that advice a lot. Christine was my sunshine. Thank you to all the Windrush parents who worked tirelessly for their children to be educated, to go to university, to aim high, despite having to work and fight as hard as twice as hard as their white neighbours for that job or university place. These children grew to be people like my A-level teacher, Barbara, who opened our eyes and hearts to African and Caribbean literature and the political poetry of Linton Questy Johnson. There are the countless cultural contributions for the art born in, from the Windrush generation that grew the pioneering music scene that we have now. Growing up, reggae music was part of the fabric of my life. Having inspired a whole new wave of genres, Jamaicans gave birth to the likes of dance hall, ska and soca, all of which are a response to reggae because of the nostalgia for their home culture. Thank you, Bob Marley, the specials, Toots and the Matals, and for Norman Jay for the good times at Carnival, to, to name a few. Many reggae artists have links in the borough. Bob Marley and the Whalers performed a series of concerts at Hammersmith Odeon as part of the Uprising tour. And just last week, the what last week at the Shepherds, the Shepherds Bush record label Greensleeves was off on honoured with a blue plaque for their contribution to reggae music, signing artists such as Barrington Levy, Dennis Brown, and Gregory Isaacs. We are fully we are grateful to the many members of Windrush who made their home in Hammersmith and Fulham, contributing greatly to the area's economy, public service, and culture. And we celebrate here their countless contributions to us all. We are reminded of the tragic injustice of the Windrush scandal. Many individuals who had lived here for decades, building lives, homes, families, invited by the UK government, suddenly found themselves at risk of being treated as illegal immigrants with the threat of deportation, loss of their homes, and some being denied healthcare. Their mistreatment amounted to institutionalized racism. Being a second generation Greek Cypriot, my parents came to England in 1960. They built lives and communities here in a similar way to the Windrush community. While this community also faced hardships, we were not asked to prove our status. We were never denied healthcare and we were not to be threatened with deportation. And let me be clear, the difference in how we were treated was mostly due to the color of our skin. The injustices that the Windrush generation face are not only part of history, they persist today. Five years ago, the government offered a compensation scheme for the suffering of injustices of the Windrush scandal, but, but most who applied for the scheme are still waiting to be compensated. Sadly, some have died waiting for the decision. The scheme is failing because it is overly complex and not fit for purpose. There is a callous disregard for the issues that have been raised about this scheme, and we call upon Suella Braverman to apologise to all its Stella. victims for its failing. Stella. thank you. Time thank is you. off. Thank you. Uh, are there any other speakers, please? I now call on Councillor Holder to sum up. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, th there's not very much I need to say. I think it's been said by everybody. I'm sure that the Windrush generation that live in Hammersmith and Fulham still would welcome today's unity between the oppositions and ourselves on the praise and gratitude of the Windrush generation. However, basically this, this motion is seeking for us to actually support um, that work be done to, um, to overcome what is still an ongoing problem about the compensation and I would therefore welcome everybody's support in making sure that we vote unanimously for this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Is the motion agreed? I declare the motion carried. Right, um, I'm going to take a comfort break for 10 minutes. Thank you.
No, I know. It's what you say. Yeah. But I, I miss, I miss out. Um, I miss word out. Do you know what I mean? Because they miss the meaning. I nearly did. I did actually. Uh, I could have paralleled it in with the. Uh, I think we should um, initiate we should do more art in the borough. Yeah. Maybe not cash it now as such, but you know. I'm going to stretch my leg. Yeah.
Can I have everybody back to their seats, please? Yes, I've moved the time. Right. Right. Item 6.7, special motion 7. I call upon. Uh, I call upon Councillor Coleman and Ray to move and second, please. Formally second. Thank you. Uh, I call on Councillor Coleman, followed by Councillor Ray, to speak for the administration. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Mayor. Sorry. <laughs> um, I just think we, you, you had a lot of um, detail already. Um, I think it's very important to make one thing clear and to uh, be absolutely in no doubt about what's happened. The government pledged to refurbish Charing Cross Hospital by 2030. Very straight pledge in the new hospital program repeated by the Member of Parliament, Chelsea and Fulham. The government is not now going to refurbish Charing Cross Hospital or rebuild Hammersmith Hospital or rebuild St Mary's Hospital by 2030. That is a fact. That is a fact. It's a fact stated again and again, not just by me, but by the hospital. And if I may, just for a minute, give you just a few, a few of the words. There was an evidence session with Michelle Dixon, who has worked for the hospital many years. She's director of engagement and experience. And she uh, came to the Hammersmith and Fulham Health and Wellbeing Board, which I chair, on the 22nd of June. Um, all of this, for those of you who love to watch these things, is on the LBHF YouTube channel. That's 26 minutes in. And she said, just to be really clear, this is, this is a very senior person at Imperial, just to be really clear, we are still in the new hospital program, but the original commitment for the 40 hospitals in that original program was to have had the building happened by 2030. And you're absolutely right, because I suggested it was not um, no longer the case. Seven schemes, three of the Imperial hospitals, are now not being committed to being finished by 2030 because other schemes were reprioritized for funding before then. Crudely, what happened is they chucked seven schemes out of the new hospital, 40 by 2030. They brought seven cheaper, quicker schemes in. And, and Imperial, three Imperial hospitals, Charing Cross, Hammersmith, and, and St. Mary's, which need about four billion pounds for the proper refurbishment rebuilding, were chucked out. There's no, there's no deadline, there's no money. So I um, so she said, she went on and she said, so what we've been told is that we'll get funding to complete our business case process. That's the first of the three stages before you get any money to the end of that process. And for some enabling works, but it's clear that the bulk of the capital money to complete the schemes will not be committed until post 2030. So I said, so the money to complete the schemes, you, you, may, you mean you may be able to start building work sooner? And she said, no. This is just this nuance between enabling works. Because there are some people claiming that the works are going, well, I'm sorry, not there aren't some people claiming. Greg Hans has stuck it on a leaflet that the works are going to begin in 2024. So I don't see why I should push your foot around that, not some people. She said, no, this is just the nuance between enabling works. <laughs> Two things. Enabling works are things like getting our power supply up to scratch so we can actually expand. It will be preparing decant works, getting stuff started. It's absolutely not, said the Imperial Director, it's absolutely not the main capital spend, the millions and millions and millions to actually get the projects going. That's the difference. So we don't know when we'll get the main capital funding, but certainly we know that it's unlikely to be before 2030, or certainly the commitment is that it will not be there before 2030. And I just to double down on that because I think people are trying to create a new reality. I said, so you're not expecting to get the funding to undertake the actual work putting shovels in the ground, so to speak, until after 2030. And she said, exactly. Now, it's very easy for me to say all this, and it's very easy for you to hear it, and it's very easy for anyone watching to go and check this. It's the YouTube channel, LBHF, 26 minutes in, you can watch the whole evidence session. So when we have um, strange claims driven um, 
uh, by the Member of Parliament that the funding is secure and it's going to happen and they're committed. It's about the way, you know, if I committed to, to, to taking us all to Mars, I could say I'm fully committed to doing that. There's no money, there's no deadline, but I'm committed to it. What I think we need to do in this chamber is we need to accept the reality of what's happening. And we need to put aside the politics, if I may. And what I'm asking you to do is to understand the absolute facts of the matter. And when you understand the facts of the matter, how can you not join with us and join with residents and join with Hammersmith and Fulham Save Our NHS? How can you not fight to get Charing Cross the funding it was promised by the government for the floor by floor refurbishment by 2030? How can you not join with us to do that now that the facts are so starkly clear to you? Thank you. I call, I call on Councillor Reid to speak, please. Thank you, Mayor. Now, there's a lot of cynicism in politics, but whenever I hear somebody say that politics has never changed anything, I automatically tell them about the successful campaign to save Charing Cross Hospital. This was a campaign by a dedicated group of local residents, some of whom were here this evening, who were able to overturn Shaping a Healthier Future, a programme that would have closed Charing Cross A&E, removed 300 acute beds, demolished much of the hospital, and seen the majority of the site sold for development. This was a long and bitter campaign, but ultimately it is the story of a committed band of local campaigns who are not prepared to see the lives of their friends, their families, and their neighbours put at risk by a dangerous set of plans to vandalise health services in our borough. It's inspiring stuff and something that everybody in the campaign and the council and in the community should rightly be proud of. It's a shame that the story didn't end there. As this motion says, on the 25th of May, the government announced that Charing Cross, Hammersmith and St. Mary's hospitals were no longer on the list of hospitals to be refurbished or rebuilt by 2030. As Councillor Coleman has said, a commitment to carry out work with no deadline and no, no budget is no commitment at all. I want to focus my remarks this evening on three areas. Firstly, the dire need for refurbishment at these local hospitals. Secondly, the overdue repairs and maintenance that uh, exist as a result of, uh, of work being put off due to shaping a healthier future. And finally, the deliberate conflating of these two important issues uh, by the local Conservative Party. This year, Charing Cross Hospital celebrates its 50th anniversary on its present site in Hammersmith. St. Mary's is even older, established in 1845, with many parts of the site uh, no longer suitable for their current use. We see regular floods, ceiling collapses and sewage leaks, uh, which lead to closing wards, closing operating theatres and outpatient clinics. The new hospital programme should have been uh, a shot in the arm. It should have given these hospitals a new lease of life and the ability to provide world-class treatment across West London. Their removal from the programme is, in the words of Professor Tim Orchard, hugely damaging for the health and healthcare of hundreds of thousands of people. For seven years, as Shaping a Healthier Future had proposed closing large parts of these hospitals, necessary repairs and maintenance were not carried out, creating a huge backlog of vital work that must now be completed. Imperial College Health Trust has calculated that to eradicate the current backlog of maintenance at Charing Cross alone, it would cost 344 million pounds. Now this includes four million pounds to repair a failed roof in the tower, 30 million pounds to bring the ventilation system up to appropriate standards, 24 million pounds to upgrade the electricity supply to meet the additional demand in the A&E, the acute stroke unit and the main operating theatre, 20 million pounds to fix the cast iron drainage system which regularly bursts, impacting clinical services, and tens of millions of pounds to replace mechanical and electrical systems currently operating well beyond their original life. The repairs are vital to be able to continue providing health care today, but without the refurbishment of our hospitals, they will not be able to provide care in the future. Now, the local Conservative Party supported the Shaping a Healthier Future plans initially claiming that there were no plans to downgrade Charing Cross, but then after seven years, performing a rapid vault fast to claim credit for saving the hospital. Now, today we've seen Greg Hans publish a leaflet 
claiming that the announcement that our local hospitals are no longer part of the new hospital programme is actually a commitment to go ahead with the building work and trumpeting the programme's £20 billion of funding without mentioning that none of that is committed to our local hospitals. We have heard the Secretary of State, Stephen Barclay, wrongly claim that building work had already started at Charing Cross, when we know this isn't the case. When people passing by see work being carried out at the hospital, uh, this is part of the growing list of repairs needed to keep the hospital operating on a day-to-day -day basis, not the vital work to build for the future. As local politicians, it is important that we are straight with the voters and with our residents about what is going on. This council should be unanimous in calling for a commitment to rebuild our local hospitals, one that includes the necessary funding and appropriate deadlines. A sticking plaster approach is not good enough. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mayor, you must speak. Yes, uh, uh, Mayor, under standing order E6, uh, 15E6, uh, we wish to propose an amendment to special motion seven. Uh, the amendment is to replace the wording of the motion with the wording already published under special motion four. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, an, an amendment has been submitted for this motion. I call on Council Lloyd Harris and Afonso to move and second the amendment. Formally move. Formally seconded. I invite Council Lloyd Harris and Afonso to speak on the amendment. Thank you. Mayor, um, our thoughts and prayers are with the three people who were stabbed at Central Middlesex Hospital on Wednesday, the 21st of June. Our NHS celebrated its 75... I'm sorry, sorry for interrupting you. Could you speak up a bit? I can't hear you. Sorry. Our, N our NHS celebrated its 75th birthday on the 5th of July and has locally benefited from the energy and commitment of the Windrush generation and others who have worked over the years tirelessly at Charing Cross, Hammersmith and St Mary's Hospitals. Our amendment motion is based on my official complaint to the monitoring officer complaining about the misleading and indeed false content of the Council Weekly e-newsletter to borough residents and the use of Council taxpayers' funds to pay for this falsehood. There is an expectation that Council literature to residents be truthful and accurate. This e-newsletter failed this test. The council e-newsletter headlined aimed to purposely mislead the public into believing that the refurbishment of Charing Cross Hospital was scrapped, despite the numerous interviews, press releases, and information coming from the Secretary of State and Department for Health stating the obvious, uh, sorry, it is obvious actually, it was the opposite of it. Clearly this was done for political gain. The erroneous but emotive headline on the 24th of May, which read Charing Cross Hospital refurbishment scrapped, is plainly untrue. I'm concerned that the council deemed this acceptable to promote. The fact it was done with full knowledge that the claims were untrue and would cause distress amongst those who utilize and benefit from the services is nothing short of appalling. Mayor, unfortunately, Hammersmith and Fulham Labour has a history of claiming the imminent demise of Charing Cross Hospital whenever an election looms. Historically, the NHS has had to tell the council to stop publishing misleading claims about Charing Cross. In a letter dated the 27th of March, which I have here, 2017, Dr. Tracy Button, then the Chief Executive of Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust, wrote the leader of the council saying, as you will be fully aware, there has never been any plans to close Charing Cross Hospital and that we, that's Imperial uh, Healthcare Trust, request that you stop any further promotion of this leaflet and publicly retract your misleading claims. For the sake of clarity and to avoid any confusion, Charing Cross Hospital is to be refurbished floor by floor, commencing 2024, subject to su successful survey works. The works to Charing Cross will include the full floor-by-floor -floor refurbishment, 
so the hospital is protected for generations to come. Secondly, there'll be a brand new energy centre, which will make the hospital greener, sustainable and cost efficient. When I received the monitoring officer's response to my complaint, he agreed with me, and I quote, that the briefing is a council publication as it was written and published by the council and therefore the council is responsible for its content. Furthermore, he added, I accept that if readers only read the headline, then they might reasonably think that the refurbishment of the hospital had been scrapped rather than the refurbishment plan. I'm glad that the council issued a clarification on the 20th of June because of the issues that I raised. While the use of the headline, government clarifies Charing Cross Hospital will be refurbished, but not completed before 2030, infers that it was the government that caused the confusion. I'm glad that the lie that the entire project has been scrapped is no longer being spread. Looking towards the future, Greg Hands MP and Professor Tim Orchard, Chief Executive of Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust, recently met to discuss the Trust's plans and the next steps of the refurbishment of Charing Cross Hospital. The administration should reassure borough residents that the refurbishment will take place and undo some of the damage they have inflicted on residents, patients and staff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mayor. On the 25th of May, the government announced that the floor by floor refurbishment of Charing Cross Hospital was going ahead with work expected to begin in 2024, subject to its successful survey works, as my colleague has just said. This includes the floor by floor refurbishment and the creation of the brand new energy centre. Mayor, we had hoped that the floor by floor refurbishment would be completed by 2030. However, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused considerable damage to the national finances, and therefore works will take longer than previously thought. Madam Mayor, we should not forget that in early 2020, our NHS faced, faced its greatest challenge to date, the COVID-19 pandemic. Our NHS rose to the occasion, and many people owe their lives to the life-saving treatments provided at our fantastic hospitals like Charing Cross, like Hammersmith Hospital. The speedy rollout of our British-made Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine was the first of its kind in Europe. Bold steps were taken to back the science and the science delivered. Madam Mayor, on the 26th of May, 2023, the administration sent an online newsletter using council resources to thousands of residents with the headline, Charing Cross Hospital Refurbishment Scrapped. They used this headline knowing full well the government had confirmed the funding for the floor by floor refurbishment mm -hmm. the day before. They also know full well that most people don't read beyond the headline. Some reports suggest that on average, eight out of 10 people only read the headline. Therefore, it is inappropriate and dangerous for Hammersmith and Fulham Labour to abuse their position in using taxpayer funded resources to push false political messaging which undermines local democracy. Madam Mayor, NHS funding now stands at record levels. The United Kingdom ranked sixth in the OECD's recently published list for healthcare spending, with 11.3% of GDP being spent on healthcare. This is almost 45% of day-to-day -day public spending, hardly a denial of resources. Mayor, the government has made two major announcements recently, which will secure the future of our NHS. Firstly, the AI Diagnostic Fund, which will accelerate the deployment of the most promising AI imaging and decision support tools to help diagnose patients more quickly for conditions such as cancers, strokes, and heart conditions. This includes a commitment to rolling out AI to 100% of stroke networks by the end of 2023, up from 86%. Secondly, the NHS Long-Term Workforce Plan which will train more staff by funding the largest ever expansion in domestic education and training places, significantly increasing the number of training places across the workforce. Secondly, it will retain staff with a renewed focus that means up to 130,000 staff stay working in the NHS longer, 
action will be taken to improve the culture, the leadership, and the well-being of NHS staff, including modernizing the NHS pension scheme through new retirement flexibilities to help retained experienced staff. And thirdly, it will reform how staff work, modernizing the way people work and train, including increasing the number of degree level apprenticeships to enter nursing. Mayor, we on this side take solace in the knowledge that our government has a long-term plan for the NHS. Our government got our country through COVID and our government will build an NHS suitable for the 21st century. Thank you. Um, I just want to remind members that I would like to be addressed as mayor, please. Um, I've been informed that councillors Mary Ginsburg, Vaughan Perez, and Pascal Tolbert Barra, sorry, also wish to speak. Councillor Mary. Thank you, Mayor. Last week, we celebrated the 75th birthday of the crowning achievement that is the National Health Service, one of Britain's finest creations, an example of who we are and what we can be, a gift, not from the heavens above, but made by us, proof that we can reshape society to be more just, more universal, more humane, proof of that ultimate hidden truth that the world is something that we make and could just as easily make differently. Before its creation, your health was in the hands of a charitable elite or benevolent religious groups. Your health was contingent on your wealth. But with the dawning of the NHS came the closing of one chapter and the opening of the next. A clarion call for all those committed to this one simple fact, that each and every human being is worthy of dignity and respect simply by virtue of being alive. At Charing Cross Hospital last week, it was easy to see that spirit alive. I'm proud to have Charing Cross in my ward, but it serves hundreds of thousands of people, Londoners and residents from far further afield. Every single one of them with their own personal stories, a child saved, a mother healed, lives transformed, and none of it taken for granted at all. It's no wonder there are few institutions in the world as revered as the NHS. It inspires a devotion and love, virtually impossible to replicate because people get it. It took dedication, blood, tears, toil and sweat for the NHS to be born. It takes dedication, blood, tears, toil and sweat for the NHS to function every single day. And it will be a similar level of dedication that ensure it survives. And why do I say all this? We all know how worthy the NHS is of our love and reverence. Surely that's enough. Well, as we also well know, the battle to keep the NHS alive and Charing Cross Hospital safe is a daily one. First, as my colleague Councillor Ree mentioned, our community and our movement rallied together to save Charing Cross from certain death. A statement of intent from the Conservative government and their local councillors. Now, through their inaction, their ambiguity, their disingenuousness. They intend to serve Charing Cross a slow, painful demise. They've kicked the desperately needed refurbishment into the long grass with no clear timeline, no clear funds, and no clear commitment. Without the funding and works, things won't just stay the same. They'll go backwards. The choice isn't between progress and stagnation. It's between progress and decline. Things need to be sustained. Dare I say it, they need to be conserved. So do they want the NHS to survive for another 75 years and beyond? It doesn't seem like it. By the end of this century, the NHS and Charing Cross Hospital could remain beacons of a world that's possible. It will require investment, constant focus, an unshakable commitment, and the Labour government. But it has to start with this government's broken promise to be kept, to refurbish and rebuild Charing Cross and Hammersmith and St. Mary's hospitals by 2030. The residents understand that. We on this side understand that. If the conservative opposition understand that too, and I believe many of them do, this is their chance to show it. Vote for our motion. Put the NHS 
before party politics. Pastor, Pastor Misleading statements. That is all the Labour Party has to say about Charing Cross Hospital. They have been doing so for years. They seek to weaponize Charing Cross because of their misplaced perception that there is some sort of political advantage to doing so. But where is the political advantage in spreading fear and distress to your own residents? We've been asked to put politics aside, but it is the Labour Party that relentlessly politicizes this issue. As Councillor Lloyd Harris has mentioned, on the 27th of March, 2017, the NHS itself had to write to the administration to note their leaflets incorrect and misleading claims, to point out that there have never been any plans to close Charing Cross Hospital, to highlight that this literature would cause significant unnecessary distress to patients and staff, and to reflect that it is difficult to understand why the council would choose to spend significant sums of public money fighting closure plans that do not exist. It is worth pausing for a moment to reflect on quite how serious that formal complaint was. This was not written by a political party or a pressure group. This was written by Dr. Tracy Batten, the chief executive of Imperial College Healthcare of the NHS, NHS Trust. The very people that the Labour Party claimed to be saving had to write to them to insist they stop misleading the public. Unfortunately, the administration did not learn its lesson. As we've heard tonight, it recently misled the public again through taxpayer-funded literature claiming that the refurbishment works had been scrapped. This once again propagated their fantasy that Charing Cross Hospital is under threat. It isn't, and it never has been. This conduct was so egregious that the council had to issue a clarification highlighting this misleading propaganda. The truth is that the floor by floor refurbishment is going ahead owing to the outstanding work of our MP, Greg Hands, who has fought tirelessly to ensure that Charing Cross remains the bedrock of healthcare in our community. The refurbishment forms part of the government's record investment in the NHS, which recently sought commit to an additional 3.3 billion pounds per year over the next two years. This follows the government's world leading rollout of COVID-19 vaccines, and the NHS's outstanding response to the pandemic. The government's industrious approach to public services stands in stark contrast to the Labour administration in this borough, which refuses to reopen Hammersmith Bridge, continually fails on housing, with the housing ombudsman having to be called in again earlier this year, has imposed a traffic scheme in the borough without proper consultation, which is killing local business, as we've heard this evening, and is crippling household budgets with rises in council tax in direct conflict with the policy of their national leader. The truth is they don't want to talk about these issues that they are actually responsible for and they can actually change. Rather, they want to spend taxpayers' money funding misleading propaganda to scare local residents. The Labour Party should campaign on issues that it can control and get on with delivering the services that this borough so desperately needs. Yeah. Thank you. I call upon Councillor Vaughan to speak, please. Um, thank you, Mayor. And sorry, let me welcome you as the Mayor, um, uh, having been elected in uh, May. Well, here we are again. <laughs> Another kick in the teeth for our local health services with broken promises from this Tory government. This time, the promise to ensure the much, much needed refurbishment of Charing Cross and Hammersmith hospitals and the rebuild of St Mary's by 2030. Followed, as we've heard several times tonight, by fantastical denials from the Conservative opposition that that is the case. Pathetic. I'll come to the refurbishment work later. However, first, and we've mentioned this already, as we know, the government, this Tory government and h &F Conservatives have form when it comes to Charing Cross. You'll remember it's hardly five minutes since the most misnamed Shaping a Healthier Future plan was scrapped. Let's cast our, mind backs, our minds back. Shaping a Healthier Future was launched in June 2012. It proposed, and 
people opposite can look this up. They probably, they don't seem to remember it very well. A local hospital, making Charing Cross a local hospital, basically a clinic 13% of the size of the current hospital with few services on site. We campaign with residents against those appalling plans. But would you believe, Mayor, a few short months later, February 2013, the Conservative administration backed them. They claimed they'd won concessions. They sent out an now infamous leaflet to residents claiming that Charing Cross had been saved. You remember the one, it had a big word saved in big red letters across a picture of Charing Cross. But no one was fooled and they, them alone, destroyed any trust in their then administration. Fortunately, despite their prevarication, the plans were then reviewed as Labour controlled Ealing Council threw us a lifeline by referring the proposals to the Secretary of State. And we, the new administration in 2000, the Labour administration in 2014, working with residents, took a new approach. We, and you'll remember other North West London councils, commissioned the independent Mansfield Commission report on shaping a healthy future. Their damning report said the plans needed to be halted, stating that the reforms, both proposed and implemented thus far, are deeply flawed. We also refused to sign up to the so-called Sustainability and Transformation Plan, which included the continued implementation of Shaping a Healthy Future. And we also commissioned a follow-up review of Shaping a Healthy Future and the STP. All of that pressure by this administration, working with residents, led to the right results. And in 2019, the government dropped its plans for Charing Cross. And now we come to today. The Health Secretary has confirmed that Charing Cross, Hammersmith and St Mary's are no longer on the list to be refurbished or rebuilt by 2030. Imperial College NHS Trust have confirmed this too, expressing their deep disappointment. But unsurprisingly, h and Conservatives are up to their old tricks, lauding proposals to refurbish Charing Cross in leaflets and tonight, despite the fact that there is no guaranteed funding and no timetable with the 2030 deadline having been scrapped. Also misleadingly quoting the monitoring officer in their motion, their amendments night, who noted that the point about made in the article complained about, namely that the plan to refurbish by 2030 had been scrapped, would be clear had readers read on, i.e. reading the full article. Now, I don't know about people here, but reading all of an article is always a good way to understand what's actually saying. Um, and in fact, that is the point that the monitoring officer made and which was omitted in the speeches that have been made tonight. So what the opposition's position amounts to is this, I can't believe it really, is what they want to do is welcome an announcement that the government will refurbish Charing Cross and Hammersmith by an unspecified future date with unspecified funding. Really? You really think that us and residents welcome that? Our residents deserve better than the nonsense that you spout. Our hospitals urgently need refurbishing and you're not the ones that are going to do it. And here's the thing though, the timing is crucial. Imperial are already spending six to seven million pounds a year on maintenance, just the bits of patching up. And as we've also heard, they estimate that, eradicate, that if they were just to eradicate the full backlog of maintenance, that would cost 344 million at Charing Cross and 105 million at Hammersmith. And there are many examples of the vital repairs that are needed, some of which we discussed tonight, but most of the lifts at both hospitals are beyond their recommended lifespan and will cost 18 million per site to repair. New ventilation is required at both sites, total cost around 50 million. Electricity supplies need upgrading at both sites with a cost in the region of 50 million. And these are just a few examples. Councillor Vaughan, Councillor Vaughan, your time is up. Thank you. Councillor Perez. Um, thank you, thank you, Mayor, for calling on me to speak in support of this special motion. Firstly, I would like to congratulate the NHS for its recent 75th birthday. Last week, I joined Hafson and other colleagues outside Charing Cross Hospital to celebrate this remarkable milestone. 
I was moved and enthused by the innumerable passersby patients and campaigners like Gloria and Sandra commemorating this special occasion, not forgetting, of course, the cars, buses, and motorcyclists honking in solidarity. This anniversary is a special date for me to remember and reflect on the fantastic service that I've had the privilege of receiving over the years. I remember the care and compassion that I was treated with during my few visits to the a &E department, and more importantly, when giving birth to my daughter. Having had challenges with my health throughout my pregnancy, I'm eternally grateful to the caring and dedicated staff, many from the Windrush generation, for her safe delivery back in September 2011. Major, for, while there is plenty to celebrate about the NHS, its achievements and accomplishments, and I'm sure many of us have personal stories to share, this doesn't negate the fact that significant improvements are required. Our local hospitals are in dire need of funding and refurbishment, and our residents are being let down by the tourist broken promises. They are also being let down by Great Hans' lack of integrity in refusing to be honest about what has happened. With the new hospital program, a pledge, when the, with the new hospital program, a pledge was made by the Conservative government in September 2019 to refurbish and rebuild Charing Cross, Hamilton, and St. Mary's Hospital by 2030. However, I've heard and, and many colleagues have, have, have uh, repeated this. How six weeks ago, the Secretary of State for Health, Sven Barkley, dropped the pledge. He said that the refurbishment and rebuilding works for these three hospitals would not complete construction until after 2030. We have heard as well how Professor Tim Orchard, Chief Executive of the Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust, which runs the three hospitals, said the health secretary's statement was clearly disappointing and hugely damaging for the health and healthcare of hundreds of thousands of people. I repeat, hundreds of thousands of people. I completely agree and empathize with his disappointment. Having read Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust's annual report, since the new hospital program was announced, I noted that one of the most significant risks facing the trust in 2019, 2020, was the state's redevelopment. The report referenced the desperately needed redevelopment and refurbishment of all states. The 2021-2022 annual report also incorporates a section on the capitals program titled Managing Our Aging State and Planning for Major Redevelopment. It sets out how throughout the pandemic, the trust worked hard to progress much needed plans for the redevelopment of all three of their main sites while managing ongoing maintenance issues caused by the old and poor condition of their state. For St. Mary's, this included a high level master plan for the whole site, exploring the scale of the total development. For Charing Cross Hospital, it included a plan for major refurbishment plus some significant rebuilding. And for Hammersmith Hospital, the plan was for a mix of redevelopment and some new building. Following a year in which many of their plans were overtaken by the continuing need to respond to COVID-19, the trust was looking forward to making more progress on their strategic goals and mitigating the deterioration of the aging state while finding a way to progress much needed redevelopment. Now, however, everything is up in the air. It's not just that refurbishment and rebuilding won't be completed before 2030, which is bad enough given the desperate state of the hospitals. It's also that there is no guarantee this work will be completed after that. There is simply no guarantee that any, any capital spent will be made available for Imperial. For great hands to claim the funding is secure is nonsense. The reality is that the trust is not getting the funding or refurbishment it was promised by 2030. This leaves it unable to forecast long-term measures such as reductions of waiting times, as any loss of building capacity will have a knock-on effect on services within the hospitals. Imperial Trust told our health and well-being board recently that they have already had the mothball award at St. Mary's site, as it is not safe to use. The more these sort of things happen, the greater the pressure on Charing Cross. The ending of the commitment to refurbish Charing Cross and rebuild St. Mary's by 2030 is bad for the people of this borough. It's NHS staff and all. The Conservative government has broken its promise on Charing Cross and Great Hands MP is misleading people by refusing to acknowledge this. I hope that all members here tonight will support our residents and support Charing Cross hospitals and the other hospitals. Thank you. Thank you. Before I call, thank you, thank you. Before I call the next speaker, I just want to say, due to the outbreak 
during the meeting, 28 minutes will be added to the end of the meeting. Thank you. And I'll call upon Councillor Pascal Tolbara. My right to speak on this one, Mayor. Councillor Cohen. Apologies, thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, now, I started my speech on the, uh, the main motion by talking about cynicism in politics. There are few things more cynical than, accuse than accusing the administration of misleading the public in an amendment that is based entirely on a letter that doesn't actually say what the amendment claims that it does. And I wanted to pick up on the point that Councillor Vaughan raised in his speech, we've had, we have an amendment here before us that claims that the monitoring officer has decided that the council has misled the public. Well, that's just not what it says at all. Councillor Lloyd Harris quoted selectively from the letter and the amendment makes claims uh, as to what it says. Now, it's, it's illustrative that the content of the letter isn't actually included in the text of the amendment that they've put together. I wonder why. I, I can only assume it's because Councillor Lloyd Harris and Councillor Afonso don't actually want uh, it to be on the record what the letter says. They would rather focus on innuendo uh, and making inaccurate claims. Luckily, the letter itself has been posted in full on the at HF Con Councillor's Twitter account. The con in the name uh, really proving that nominative determinism is alive and well in this case. According to this amendment, the letter says that the political language suggesting that the refurbishment of Charing Cross Hospital would not go ahead was inappropriate. Well, that would be bad if the monitoring officer had said that. But the letter doesn't say this. At no point in the letter does the monitoring officer say that anything is inappropriate. In fact, he doesn't even use the word inappropriate. The amendment says that the administration should apologise for telling residents that the refurbishment of Charing Cross Hospital had been scrapped. Again, the letter from the monitoring officer that this is based on doesn't even agree that this is the, the conclusion. The letter says, and I'm going to quote directly from it because words matter, their meanings matter, uh, even if the opposition putting their amendments together don't think that they do. The letter says, my present view is that the headline to which you refer is within the parameters of the local authority publicity code, as the meaning of this headline is explained immediately in the first paragraph. In other words, not only have the opposition not read the monitoring officer's letter properly, they couldn't even be bothered to read the first line of the thing that they're complaining about. Now, the monitoring officer is not a councillor. When the opposition partially and inaccurately report things that he says, he does not have a public platform to rebut these claims. If anyone should be apologising here this evening, it should be the proposer and the seconder of this motion who have put the monitoring officer in this position. The amendment ends. This council further calls upon the administration not to spread false information, alarming the most vulnerable in our community for party political purposes. I think that this advice is advice the local Conservative Party should really take to heart. Now, Councillor Lloyd Harris's letter of complaint was posted on Twitter at the beginning of June. The truth is that the opposition have tried to score cheap political Excuse points. Excuse me, um, I've been personally known. Could I just make a comment, please, about the fact that please hang on, comment? Come, come on, please, Harris. please tell me what please the hang on, please. standing order 15. Um, I'd like to state for the record come that. Come on, tell us. Yes. Can you just give me a moment, please? Yes, of course. Um, <laughs> You can continue. So, is that okay? Yeah. Um, I would actually like to clarify that point because I did not put it on Twitter. I'm not on Twitter. And also, I published the uh, letter from the monitoring office officer on next door, as I said I would to so everyone. When it, was, it, is, it is not irrelevant. It is goes it to relevant? show. I've not claimed no, it. it is relevant. I'm sorry, you've said it. It is relevant because of the motion that we put. 
So that is in the public domain for everybody to see, which is why I said I would post it. And that's it. Okay. So please do not accuse me of being on Twitter when I have no Twitter. Uh, I'm 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 sure the the residents of the borough are poorer for, for I'm sure the residents of the borough are poorer for you not being uh, on Twitter. Um, but but if you listen to what I said, I, I didn't actually say that you would put it on Twitter. I said it had been put on Twitter by this at HF Con Council's Twitter account. Now I didn't say that that was you. Uh, I have no idea who who controls that. I mean, I, I can guess from the name, but uh, but uh, I've I've no idea. Now. Look, the letter uh, of complaint was put on Twitter, by whom uh, we can only speculate, at the beginning of June. The truth is that the opposition have tried to score a cheap political point by making a complaint, wasting the monitoring officer's time, and then trying to publicise this to the world. When they didn't get the response that they were hoping for from the monitoring officer, they've exaggerated what he said to try and squeeze some political capital out of their attack. It hasn't worked and they've just ended up looking a bit silly. But there is a serious point to all this. The way that the Conservative Party has conducted itself during the campaign to save Charing Cross and today uh, it, with these new threats to the hospital has been disgraceful. They took the residents of this borough for fools and this is in uh, no small part the reason why there are just 10 of them here today. I say this to the newer members of the group. Do not go down this road again. Do not listen to the voices of people who will try to argue for you to follow the politics of the gutter as they have done in the past. It didn't work then and it won't work now. We are elected to deal with serious issues. We should discuss them in a serious way. This amendment is not serious. This behavior is not serious. And I'd advise you to aim a little higher in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dad. Councillor Cowan. Councillor Cowan, you wish. Any other speakers? Yeah, uh, Councillor Cowan. No, just ask any other speakers. Any other, any other speakers on this, please? Yep. Can't, I can't. No, no. no, there's a speaker behind you. Oh, I'm sorry. Councillor Schmidt. Mayor, this is a very, very clear issue. Anyone who goes to Charing Cross, Hammersmith, or St. Mary's now will know as they walk around the building in severe states of disrepair, that 2030 is already much too late for those repairs. The decade that we lost, almost decade that we lost to saving healthier future has already put those hospitals behind the curve. We should be acting urgently to push 2030 forward and make it sooner. Those hospitals desperately need um, ra a, a radical refurbishment. When they found out in May, that not only would it not be brought forward, but the 2030 deadline would be abandoned and that the program would be dropped from the funded budget, the opposition and Greg Hans, the MP, had two options. They could have shared the disappointment that Imperial Trust has and said that it's wrong and that this funding must be secured now and we must press ahead with these refurbishments. We can't wait. They could have done that or they could have put out a leaflet congratulating the government on delaying refurbishments to our local hospitals, congratulating the government for putting the health of local residents at risk. They could have invested their energy now in convincing the government constructively, if they may, into reversing course and bringing it back into the 2030 program. But instead, they're investing their energy in this silly politics this ridiculous letter that's been discussed, it's highly misleading. There's even more ridiculous amendment that's even more misleading. That's what they're putting their energy into. They have got choices and they're making that choice. And it's the same choice they made back in 2017 with Greg Hans trying to amplify a message that the hospital wasn't at threat when everyone knew it was at threat and voters obviously knew it was at threat. 
as they gave us a resounding majority in 2014, a bigger majority in 2018, and a bigger majority, majority again in 2022, with swings exceeding elsewhere in London, because they knew that local hospitals and local services are not safe in the hands of those opposite. Greg Hans has these choices. Instead, he's sending his foot soldiers in to defend the indefensible. It's the same thing he did when he had the choice whether he could have spoke out against Liz Truss's disastrous budget, which is leaving his constituents now with on average 12,000 pounds greater mortgages when they come up for renewal. Instead, he put out tweets supporting that ridiculous budget and was rewarded with a ministerial post. It's the same thing he did when he could have campaigned for government funding to refurbish Hammersmith Bridge and using his influence there, but instead he played politics and tried to get local residents to pay a massive council tax increase to fund an unrealistically high bill. Again, he sided with the government over his residence. It's the same thing he did when he backed plans for a hard Brexit and campaigned for us to come out of the single market and customs union. He could have supported a pro-European constituent base that he knew was there, but instead he backed the hard line Brexiteers in government. Time and time again, Greg Hans is the government's representative here in Chelsea and Fulham, instead of being Chelsea and Fulham, Fulham's representative in government. He puts the Tory party ahead of local residents and local residents are waking up to that and they're gonna send him packing in a few years time. And you guys could be standing up to him but you're being caught up in it as his foot soldiers and you're making once again, the wrong choice on Charing Cross and the wrong choice in failing to stand up to the government. So we oppose this ridiculous amendment and we will obviously support the main motion. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Oh, Councillor Collins. Councillor Collins, do you want to speak? Yeah. Looking at the clock. It's look. I think it's quite interesting, isn't it, when you look at the sort of twentieth century research into groupthink, and you look at people like Lemmings jumping over a cliff together irrespective of the fall. And, you know, it's been, what, 18 months now since the council elections. And when the first few ridiculous speeches were given from the opposition benches, I think all of us were prepared to cut some people some slack. But some of them are beyond parody. What's going on over there on those benches? Do they genuinely believe that Charing Cross was never under threat and they believe the nonsense that was in the letter they quoted. They didn't read out the rebuttal. They didn't read out the fact that that was a letter trying to get them to sue me in order, as the first part of a legal process, to say that we were misrepresenting. They dropped the case because they knew full well that when you get into court and you explain the facts, that their argument hung on one word, and that word was transformed because. What we were saying is you were closing Charing Cross and they were saying, no, we're not sure. We're not closing it. In fact, all of the people over there have backed that position, but it was never being closed. Yes, it was going to be demolished. Yes, most of the land was being sold off for flats. Yes, it was. Yes, it was going to be replaced by a clinic, 13% the size. And yes, they were going to call this new clinic with no beds, no doctors, Charing Cross. And yet all of those people, one of them used to distance herself from it. All of those people said that was somehow a lie to use the word closed because the word transformed was good enough. Well, it wasn't good enough, which is why they backed down, why they didn't deliver a business plan and why in the end we saved Charing Cloths. That was what happened then. And it is the height of ridiculousness that Greg Han should want to recirculate that letter. Let me tell you why. There's not a single nurse, not a single doctor, not a single person in the NHS Trust who does not know Charing Cross was being closed. There is not a single voter that sent us here in record swings who does not think these people were misleading them in supporting the Conservative cause. So utter it again and side yourselves with the ridiculous red-faced councillors sitting on the Tory benches who would yell at us as call us liars when we would make these points five years ago. Two speeches tonight have sided you with that. We will not let you forget. 
And in that same spirit, if anyone thinks in a democracy, when there is no funds allocated to the floor by floor refurbishments at Charing Cross, no plan yet to allocate the funds or to implement any floor by floor refurbishments of Charing Cross, no plan to have a plan to do the refurbishment of Charing Cross. How do we know this? Because he and I sit with health professionals and talk about this all the time. That's the truth. That's what the MP must know. And anyone who's bothered to look into the facts should know it too. So how do we end up with on the 30th May, when the scheme is delayed, possibly scrapped, possibly scrapped, because those things would lead most reasonable people to think it'd be scrapped. How does an MP tweet Thursday's statement is good news for local residents? It's not good news for local residents, is it? At the very least, it's concerning news. At the very least. And what he asked you to do as the next MP for Chelsea and Fulham is to put politics aside, as we asked previous administrations, and join with us to have a proper conversation to give a proper refurbishment of Charing Cross. Now, I spent all day yesterday in Charing Cross with a friend who was ill. I left at 10 o'clock. There was not a doctor when they found out who I was who did say, not say to me, can you help? We've got no money. But the, 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 the hospital's in a terrible condition. Why are you not? Why are you talking about a press release when you should be standing shoulder to shoulder with the residents of Hammersmith and Fulham? This is the disgraceful Conservative Party that have wrecked our country and would, if we let them in 2014, have seen the end of Charing Cross Hospital. Never let them forget. Wake up, make your decision what side you're on, because we are going to take this to the public and tell every single one of your voters exactly what you did tonight. That's the old poem. I miss that. I've got two things to mention that letter. I'm now putting the amendment to the vote. Sorry? Those in favour. Wait, wait, wait. No. I don't, sorry. Wait, wait. I'm sorry. Yeah, that... yeah, I'm not putting the amendment to the vote. Still I'm now putting the amendment to the vote. Yeah. Names. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, will councillors will councillors please indicate how they wish to vote on the amendment? Mm -hmm. Councillor Ale Councillor Alexander. Mm -hmm. Okay. Councillor Antonides. Sorry. 
Thank you. Councillor Antonides. Councillor Brown. Councillor Campbell Simon. Councillor Shafop 38. Yeah. Councillor Coleman. Yeah. Councillor Collins. Councillor Cowan. Against. Councillor Daly. Against. Councillor Harcourt. Against. Councillor Holder. Councillor Homan. Councillor James. Against. Councillor Kwan. Against. Councillor Lang. Councillor Melton. Against. Councillor Miri. Against. Councillor Morton. Councillor Nawagbe. Councillor Patel. Councillor Perez. Against. Councillor Kwam. Uh, Councillor Reed. Against. Councillor Richardson. Councillor Rowbottom. Against. Councillor Sanderson. Councillor Schmidt. Against. Councillor Taylor. Councillor Trey. Against. Councillor Ume Francis. Against. Councillor Ume Mercy. Against. Councillor Vaughan. Against. Councillor Walsh. Councillor Afonso. Four. Councillor F. Sal Khan. Four. Councillor Alford. Four. Councillor Borland. Four. Councillor Brockerbank Parler. Four. Councillor Dinsmore. Four. Councillor Carmel. Four. Councillor Lloyd Harris. Four. Councillor Pascu Tolbert. Councillor Stanson. The results of the voting um, for the amendment. I hereby announce the outcome of the voting. 4-10 against 29, no voting. The amendment is lost. Thank you. Do you wish to sum up, Councillor Coleman? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I am tempted just to sort of say what he said and leave it there. <laughs> Because it was, it was, uh, it said everything that we need to be said in a sense. But um, I, I, having heard the opposition um, I, and my colleagues took apart the sort of mess that we were presented with very effectively, I suppose I'm, I'm really left by um, Councillor Alfonso's intervention because at least he had the the decency and honesty to accept that the refurbishment has been delayed. He blamed it on COVID. He didn't blame it on government cuts and lack of funding and the fact that four billion pounds has been taken out of the program, but at least he accepted that it's been delayed. So well done you, you're a, a, a giant among um, your, your colleagues. Um, I, I have to say that the, the, the facts though, that you are all being led by the nose by a member of parliament with such a poor record on Charing Cross is distressing. If, you, if we just look back, and uh, as the leaders reminded us, that the, the Shaping Healthy Future Plan in October 2012 did all the things that he set out, including replacing the current A&E, the A&E at the time, with an urgent care clinic. And we, Greg Hans denied, very important, he denied the hospital was threatened, he denied the A&E were threatened, he said the Labour Party was scaremongering, spreading fear and false rumours, he said, quote, they've repeatedly told residents wrongly that the Conservatives plan to shut the A&E department, Charing Cross will retain its A&E. 
that we weren't telling the truth. And over the next um, four years, he said, you know, his newsletter, Greg Hans confirms that the future of Charing Cross is secure with the Conservative Party. Well, after seven long years, finally, we got Matt Hancock, we being the Labour administration and the residents shoulder to shoulder, despite the Conservative opposition, we got Matt, Matt Hancock to cancel shaping a future, health, healthier future. And Greg Hans, who said that the a and &E had not been threatened, it would retain it, said, may I thank the Secretary of State for what? For saving the a and &E which Greg Hans has said was never threatened, for saving the A&E Department of Charing Cross Hospital, which was a very, very popular move. It was a very, very popular move. It had always been the plan to shut the A&E, as we said, and Greg denied it, but at least he was very happy that the A&E had been saved. He even said, having attacked us for scaremongering, once we won, he said, you know, he said to the local paper, I deserve a lot of credit <laughs> for saving Charing Cross Hospital. This is the man who's giving you the brief that you come out with today. Just bear this in mind. So where, where does that leave us? That's what went on then. Now we're at now. The government promised to give a, a floor by reform refurbishment, refurbishment to Charing Cross by 2030 um, as part of the new hospitals program. Greg Hans tweeted and said there will be a floor by floor refurbishment. It's a very bright future for Charing Cross. And then the government broke its promise. And I've explained and we've discussed in detail that there is absolutely no doubt that the hospital is not going to be refurbished with the funding it needs by 2030. And I've quoted Imperial at length to you. And Greg Hans um, said, as, as the leader has said, that this is good news for local residents. Funding for the floor by floor refurbishment of Charing Cross is secure. The same time that Professor Tim Orchard, as you've heard, was saying that this was clearly disappointing and hugely damaging for the health and healthcare of hundreds of thousands of people. So what's going on here? He's been embarrassed and he's been caught out. And instead of saying, I think the government's made a mistake. Why don't we all come together? Why don't we come together in a united campaign to fight to save Charing Cross's refurbishment by 2030, as we've been promised it? He makes up stuff again. He says funding is secure, the way that he said previously that the future of Charing Cross Hospital was secure. Funding is not secure. There is no funding guaranteed. There is no deadline. And let me just say that if Greg Hans thinks he can fool all of the people all of the time, because this is his modus operandi, where he ain't fooling us and he ain't fooling the residents. And I'd like you to show that he ain't fooling you either and vote with us to fight to keep this hospital's refurbishment happening before 2030. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now putting the motion to the vote. Those in favour, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. please raise your hand. Those against, please raise your hands. Those not voting. The motion has been carried. The guillotine has now fallen. Add some all the motion copy. Uh, so you have six and nine, okay. So we're drawing nine. One to the vote. Can you ask him to repeat? Councillor Council Smith, could you please, Councillor Smith, could you please repeat, please? 
We'd like to withdraw special motion, um, sorry, six and special motion nine. And we'd like to put special motion one to the vote. Oh, which, um, oh. So, okay. Special, how much? No, special motion one hundred with the full pension fund. Fund is the motion agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Um, I declare the motion carried. Okay. Uh, special motion two. Special motion two happening by crime. And I'll sorry. Now we're with roaring two and three uh and four, especially since we need special motion four. Three and four were drawn. They don't all of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we now go to we'll go to the reports. <laughs> We're now going to the reports and uh, information to note. Petition petition monitoring reports twenty twenty two to twenty twenty three. In the, in the report noted, uh, review of the constitution in the report noted. Are we done? Yeah. I'm very glad to say that at the end of tonight's meeting, I'd like to thank everyone for attending and or watching. Thank you. Amen.